Hello. 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 जेत्री आत्मवदेव परान पी पश्यत आत्म परान पी पश्यत युद्धम त्यजत स्पर्धाम त्यजत त्यजत परेश्व क्रममाक्रमनम मैत्रीम भजत अखिलर जेत्रीम जननीम प्रथवीम कामदुकास्ते जननीम प्रथवीम कामदुकास्ते जनको देव सकल दयालु जनको देव सकल दयालु दाम्यत दत्त दयद्वम जनता दाम्यत दत्त दयद्वम जनता श्रेयो भूयात सकल जनाना श्रेयो भूयात सकल जनानाम श्रेयो भूयात सकल जनानाम श्रेयो भूयात सकल जनानाम श्रेयो भूयात सकल जनानाम ನಮಸ್ಕಾರ ಪ್ರಿಯ ಬಂಧುಗಳೇ ತಮ್ಮ ಎಲ್ಲ ಕಾರ್ಯಗಳನ್ನು ಬದಿಗೊತ್ತಿ ಈ ಮಹತ್ವಾಕಾಂಕ್ಷಿಯ ಕಾರ್ಯಕ್ರಮಕ್ಕೆ ಆಗಮಿಸಿರುವ ತಮ್ಮೆಲ್ಲರಿಗೂ ಹೃದಯಪೂರ್ವಕ ಸುಸ್ವಾಗತ ಕಾರ್ಯಕ್ರಮ ಕೊಂಚ ತಡವಾಗಿ ಪ್ರಾರಂಭಿಸಿದಕ್ಕಾಗಿ ಕ್ಷಮೆ ಇರಲಿ ಈ ಸುಂದರ ಸಂಜೆಯನ್ನು ದಿವ್ಯ ಮಂತ್ರಘೋಷ್ಠಿಯಿಂದ ಹಾಗೂ ಸೌಮ್ಯ ಅವರ ಇಂಪಾದ ಧ್ವನಿಯಿಂದ ಪ್ರಾರಂಭಿಸುತ್ತಿದ್ದೇವೆ ಭಗವಂತನ ಆರಾಧನೆಯು ಶ್ರೇಯಸ್ಕರವಾದ ಒಂದು ಕರ್ಮ ನಮ್ಮ ಕಣ್ಣಿಗೂ ಮನಸ್ಸಿಗೂ ಗೋಚರವಾಗುವಂತೆ ಅನೇಕ ಅವತಾರಗಳನ್ನು ಎತ್ತಿ ದಯಾಮಯಿಯಾದ ಭಗವಂತನು ಲೋಕ ಕಲ್ಯಾಣವನ್ನು ಮಾಡುತ್ತಾ ಮನಃಶಾಂತಿಯನ್ನ ನೀಡುತ್ತಾ ಬಂದಿದ್ದಾನೆ ನಾವು ಅವನ ಅರ್ಚನೆಯನ್ನು ಮಾಡುತ್ತಾ ಭಗವಂತನ ನಾನಾ ರೂಪವನ್ನ ದೇವಾಲಯಗಳಲ್ಲಿ ಆರಾಧಿಸುತ್ತಾ ಬಂದಿದ್ದೇವೆ ಈ ದೇವಸ್ಥಾನಗಳು ಹಿಂದೂ ಸಂಸ್ಕೃತಿ ಹಾಗೂ ಆಧ್ಯಾತ್ಮಿಕತೆಯ ಕೇಂದ್ರ ಬಿಂದುವಾಗಿದೆ ದೇವಾಲಯಗಳು ಆಯಾ ಸ್ಥಳದ ಪ್ರಮುಖ ಜಾಗಗಳಲ್ಲಿ ಅಂದರೆ
ಬೆಟ್ಟ ಗುಡ್ಡ ಗುಹೆ ಅಥವಾ ನದಿಯ ದಡದಲ್ಲಿ ಕಟ್ಟಲ್ಪಡುತ್ತವೆ ಯೋಗ ಜ್ಯೋತಿಷ್ಯ ಹಾಗೂ ವಾಸ್ತುಶಾಸ್ತ್ರಗಳ ಬುನಾದಿಯಲ್ಲಿ ಮೇಲೆ ನಿರ್ಮಿಸುವ ಈ ದೇವಸ್ಥಾನಗಳು ಸಾತ್ವಿಕತೆಯ ಪ್ರತೀಕವಾಗಿದ್ದು ಅಸೀಮವಾದ ಶಾಂತಿಯನ್ನ ನೀಡುತ್ತದೆ ಈ ನಮ್ಮ ಶ್ರೀಮಂತ ಸಂಸ್ಕೃತಿಯನ್ನ ಹೊತ್ತು ಮೆರೆಯುತ್ತಿರುವ ಈ ದೇವಾಲಯಗಳ ಮೇಲಿನ ಸರ್ಕಾರದ ನಿಯಂತ್ರಣ ಭಕ್ತಾದಿಗಳಲ್ಲಿ ಆತಂಕ ಮತ್ತು ತಲ್ಲಣವನ್ನ ಉಂಟು ಮಾಡಿದೆ ಇದನ್ನು ಖಂಡಿಸಿ ಪ್ರತಿಭಟಿಸುವ ಉದ್ದೇಶದಿಂದ ಇಂದಿನ ವಿಚಾರ ಸಂಕಿರಣವನ್ನ ಏರ್ಪಡಿಸಲಾಗಿದೆ ಇದೇ ಕಾರಣಕ್ಕಾಗಿ ವೇದಿಕೆಯಲ್ಲಿ ಉಪಸ್ಥಿತರಿರುವಂಥ ಗಣ್ಯರು ಹಿಂದೂ ದೇವಾಲಯಗಳು ಮತ್ತು ಸರ್ಕಾರ ನಿಯಂತ್ರಣದ ಆಗು ಹೋಗುಗಳನ್ನು ತಿಳಿಸಲು ಸಮರ್ಥಿಸಲು ಆಗಮಿಸಿದ್ದಾರೆ ಇವರ ಬೆಂಬಲ ನಮ್ಮ ಹೋರಾಟಕ್ಕೆ ಮತ್ತಷ್ಟು ಜೀವ ತುಂಬಿದೆ ಎಂದರೆ ತಪ್ಪಾಗಲಾರದು ಇಟ್ಸ್ ಇಂಡೀಡ್ ಅ ಗ್ರೇಟ್ ಆನರ್ ಟು ಹ್ಯಾವ್ ಸಚ್ ಎನ್ಲೈಟನ್ ಸೌಲ್ಸ್ ಅಮಾಂಗ್ ಅಸ್ ಟು ಗೈಡ್ ಅಂಡ್ ಸಪೋರ್ಟ್ ದಿಸ್ ಯುನೀಕ್ ಇನಿಷಿಯೇಟಿವ್ ಪರಮ ಪೂಜ್ಯ ಶ್ರೀ ದಯಾನಂದ ಸರಸ್ವತಿಯವರು ಹಿಂದೂ ಧರ್ಮ ಆಚಾರ್ಯ ಸಭಾ ಸಂಚಾಲಕರಾಗಿ ಎಲ್ಲರಿಗೂ ಮಾರ್ಗದರ್ಶನವನ್ನು ನೀಡುತ್ತಾ ನಮ್ಮ ಸಂಸ್ಕೃತಿಯನ್ನ ಉಳಿಸಿ ಬೆಳೆಸುವುದರಲ್ಲಿ ಶ್ರಮಿಸುತ್ತಿದ್ದಾರೆ ಇವರಿಗೆ ಜಿಜ್ಞಾಸ ಹಾಗೂ ಪ್ರತಿಷ್ಠಿತ ಸಭಾ ಸದಸ್ಯರ ಪರವಾಗಿ ನಮನಗಳು ಹಾಗೂ ಪರಮ ಪೂಜ್ಯರ ಆಶೀರ್ವಾದವನ್ನು ಸ್ವೀಕರಿಸುತ್ತಾ ಅವರಿಗೆ ಹೃದಯ ಪೂರ್ವಕ ಸುಸ್ವಾಗತವನ್ನ ಬಯಸುತ್ತೇವೆ ಕರ್ನಾಟಕ ವಿಧಾನ ಪರಿಷತ್ತಿನ ಸದಸ್ಯರಾದ ಪ್ರೊಫೆಸರ್ ಶ್ರೀ ಪಿ ವಿ ಕೃಷ್ಣ ಭಟ್ ರವರು ನಮ್ಮ ಕಿರು ಕಾಣಿಕೆಯನ್ನ ನೀಡಿ ಅವರನ್ನು ಆಹ್ವಾನಿಸಿ ಸ್ವಾಗತಿಸಬೇಕು ಎಂದು ಕೋರುತ್ತೇನೆ ಸ್ವಾಮೀಜಿಯವರ ಆಶೀರ್ವಾದವನ್ನು ಬಯಸುತ್ತೇವೆ ಶ್ರೀ ಆದಿಚುಂಚನಗಿರಿ ಮಹಾಸಂಸ್ಥಾನ ಮಠದ ಅಧಿಪತಿಗಳಾದ ಶ್ರೀ 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 ನಿರ್ಮಲಾನಂದನಾಥ ಸ್ವಾಮಿಯವರು ಉಪಸ್ಥಿತರಿದ್ದಾರೆ ಇವರಿಗೆ ನಮ್ಮ ಪ್ರಣಾಮಗಳನ್ನು ಅರ್ಪಿಸುತ್ತಾ ಆದರದ ಸುಸ್ವಾಗತವನ್ನ ಬಯಸ್ತೇವೆ ದಿಸ್ ಸ್ಮಾರ್ಟ್ ಫಂಕ್ಷನ್ಸ್ ಪ್ಯಾರಲ್ ಟು ದಿ ಗವರ್ಮೆಂಟ್ ಬೈ ರನ್ನಿಂಗ್ ಮೆನಿ ಪ್ರೈಮರಿ ಹೆಲ್ತ್ ಕೇರ್ ಸೆಂಟರ್ಸ್ ಆಫ್ ದ ಸ್ಟೇಟ್ under its umbrella runs many institutions this young swami ji tirelessly strives for fulfilling the task intended by his guru ivarige namma pranamagalondige aatmiya suswagata shri shankara acharya ra tatvagalanna bodhisutta anisarisuttiruva mattondu visheshavada mata kudali pradeshada shringeri mata ಅವಿಚಿನ್ನ ಪರಂಪರೆಯನ್ನು ಮೆರೆಸುತ್ತಾ ಶ್ರಮಿಸುತ್ತಿರುವ ಮಠಾಧಿಪತಿಗಳು ಸ್ವಾಮಿ ವಿದ್ಯಾಭಿನವ ಶಂಕರ ಭಾರತಿಯವರು ಇವರ ಆಗಮನ ನಮ್ಮಲ್ಲಿ ಹೊಸ ಸ್ಫೂರ್ತಿಯನ್ನ ತುಂಬಿದೆ ಇವರಿಗೂ ಸಹ ನಮ್ಮ ಪ್ರಣಾಮಗಳು ಮತ್ತು ಆದರದ ಸುಸ್ವಾಗತ ಕಾಶಾ ಶಾಖಾ ಮಠದಿಂದ ಶ್ರೀ ಕ್ಷೇತ್ರ ಬಾಳೆಯ ಹೊನ್ನೂರಿನ ಈ ಮಠಾಧಿಪತಿಗಳು ಸಹ ಆಗಮಿಸಿದ್ದಾರೆ ಸಿದ್ಧರ ಬೆಟ್ಟದ ರಂಭಾಪುರಿ ಮಠಾಧಿಪತಿಗಳಾದ ಶ್ರೀ ಸ್ವಾಮಿ ವೀರಭದ್ರ ಶಿವಾಚಾರ್ಯರವರು ನಮ್ಮೊಂದಿಗಿದ್ದಾರೆ ಇವರಿಗೆ ನಮ್ಮ ಪ್ರಣಾಮಗಳೊಂದಿಗೆ ಹಾರ್ದಿಕ ಸುಸ್ವಾಗತ ಹಾವೇರಿಯ ಹಾನಗಲ್ನಲ್ಲಿರುವಂತಹ ವಿರಕ್ತ ಮಠ ಸುತ್ತಮುತ್ತಲಿನ ಸುಮಾರು ನಲವತ್ತು ಐವತ್ತು ಹಳ್ಳಿಗಳಿಗೆ ಉಚಿತ ವಿದ್ಯಾಭ್ಯಾಸ ವಸತಿ ಹಾಗೂ ಆರೋಗ್ಯ ತಪಾಸಣೆಯ ಸೇವೆಯನ್ನು ನೀಡುತ್ತಾ ಬಂದಿದೆ ಮಠಾಧಿಪತಿಗಳಾದ ಪೂಜ್ಯಶ್ರೀ ಸ್ವಾಮಿ ಶಿವಯೋಗಿ ಅವರಿಗೆ ನಮ್ಮ ಪ್ರಣಾಮಗಳು ಹಾಗೂ ನಮ್ಮ ನಿಮ್ಮೆಲ್ಲರ ಪರವಾಗಿ ಆತ್ಮೀಯವಾದ ಸುಸ್ವಾಗತ former union minister a very senior politician and an economist an author explains well well i don't think i really have to introduce that's dr subramanian swami it's an honor sir to have dr swami who has played a major role in india's political affairs in recent years ಹಾಗೂ ಹಿಂದೂ ಧರ್ಮ ಆಚಾರ್ಯ ಸಭಾದ ಸಂಚಾಲಕರು 
ಹಾಗೂ ಕಾನೂನು ವಿಭಾಗದಲ್ಲಿ ತಮ್ಮ ಸೇವೆಯನ್ನು ಸಲ್ಲಿಸುತ್ತಿರುವ ಡಾಕ್ಟರ್ ಸುಬ್ರಹ್ಮಣ್ಯನ್ ಸ್ವಾಮಿಯವರಿಗೆ ಹೃದಯ ಪೂರ್ವಕ ಸುಸ್ವಾಗತ ಅ ನೋಟೆಡ್ ರೈಟರ್ ಅಂಡ್ ಅ ಹಿಸ್ಟೋರಿಯನ್ ಹ್ಯಾವಿಂಗ್ ರಿಟನ್ ಸೆವರಲ್ ಬುಕ್ಸ್ ಆನ್ ಸರ್ವಿಸ್ ಲಾ ಇಸ್ ಅ ಕರೆಂಟ್ ಮೆಂಬರ್ ಆಫ್ ರಾಜ್ಯಸಭಾ ನ್ಯಾಯಮೂರ್ತಿ ಶ್ರೀ ರಾಮ ಜೋಯಿಸ್ ರವರು ಪ್ರಸ್ತುತ ಸರ್ವೋಚ್ಚ ನ್ಯಾಯಾಲಯದಲ್ಲಿ ವಕೀಲರಾಗಿ ಸೇವೆಯನ್ನ ಸಲ್ಲಿಸುತ್ತಿದ್ದಾರೆ ಇವರಿಗೆ ನಮ್ಮ ನಿಮ್ಮೆಲ್ಲರ ಪರವಾಗಿ ಹೃದಯ ಪೂರ್ವಕ ಸುಸ್ವಾಗತ ಚೆನ್ನೈನಲ್ಲಿರುವಂತಹ ದೇವಾಲಯಗಳ ಭಕ್ತರ ಸಂಘದ ಮುಖ್ಯಸ್ಥರೂ ಆಗಿರುವ ಶ್ರೀ ಟಿ ಆರ್ ರಮೇಶ್ ಇವರಿಗೂ ಸಹ ಆದರದ ಸುಸ್ವಾಗತವನ್ನ ನಾವೆಲ್ಲರೂ ಬಯಸ್ತೇವೆ A best teacher awardee, author of book called Legislation for Temple and Destruction, convener of Temples Protection Movement is the Professor M. V. Saundara Rajan. He is also the managing the committee of Chilkur Balaji Temple in Andhra Pradesh. Ivarigu Saha, Jignasa, Hago, ಎಲ್ಲ ಸಂಸ್ಥೆಗಳ ಪರವಾಗಿ ಹೃದಯ ಪೂರ್ವಕ ನಮನಗಳು ಹಾಗೂ ಸುಸ್ವಾಗತ ಶ್ರೀ ಕೃಷ್ಣ ಭಟ್ ಇವರಿಗೂ ಸಹ ನಮ್ಮ ಜಿಜ್ಞಾಸ ಹಾಗೂ ಆಯೋಜಕರ ಪರವಾಗಿ ಹೃದಯ ಪೂರ್ವಕ ಸುಸ್ವಾಗತವನ್ನ ಬಯಸ್ತೇವೆ ಶ್ರೀ ಕೃಷ್ಣರಾಜ ವರ್ಮ ಕೇರಳದ ಅರಣ್ಮುಲ ದೇವಾಲಯದ ಮುಖ್ಯಸ್ಥರು ಆಗಮಿಸಬೇಕು ಅವರೂ ಸಹ ಕೊಂಚ ತಡವಾಗಿ ಬರಲಿದ್ದಾರೆ ಅವರಿಗೂ ಬಂದ ಮೇಲೆ ನಮ್ಮ ಹೃದಯ ಪೂರ್ವಕ ಸುಸ್ವಾಗತವನ್ನ ಬಯಸ್ತೇವೆ ಇದಲ್ಲದೆ ನಗರದ ಪ್ರತಿಷ್ಠಿತ ವಿವಿಧ ಮಠದ ಸದಸ್ಯರು ಸಂಚಾಲಕರು ಕೂಡ ಆಗಮಿಸಿದ್ದಾರೆ ಅನೇಕ ಸಂಘ ಸಂಸ್ಥೆಗಳ ಪ್ರತಿನಿಧಿಗಳು ಇಲ್ಲಿದ್ದಾರೆ ಸ್ವಯಂ ಸೇವಕರು ಉಪನ್ಯಾಸಕರು ಹಾಗೂ ನಮ್ಮ ಸಂಸ್ಕೃತಿಯನ್ನ ಉಳಿಸಿ ಬೆಳೆಸಲು ಶ್ರಮಿಸುತ್ತಿರುವ ಅನೇಕ ಸದಸ್ಯರು ಕೂಡ ಇಲ್ಲಿ ನಮ್ಮೊಂದಿಗಿದ್ದಾರೆ ಇವರೆಲ್ಲರಿಗೂ ಮತ್ತೊಮ್ಮೆ ಹೃದಯ ಪೂರ್ವಕ ಸುಸ್ವಾಗತವನ್ನ ಬಯಸುತ್ತಾ ಈ ವಿಚಾರಣ ಸಂಕೀರ್ಣ ಕಾರ್ಯಕ್ರಮವನ್ನ ಪ್ರಾರಂಭಿಸುತ್ತಿದ್ದೇವೆ ಜಿಜ್ಞಾಸ ತಂಡದ ಸಂಚಾಲಕರು ಶ್ರೀ ಅಮಿತ್ ಮಾಲ್ವಿಯ ಜಿಜ್ಞಾಸ ಸಂಸ್ಥೆಯ ಬಗ್ಗೆ ಒಂದು ಕಿರು ನೋಟವನ್ನ ಪರಿಚಯಿಸಲಿದ್ದಾರೆ Good evening everybody. Thank you for coming in such large numbers for this very important event. Before we set on for the program, I'd like to spend a few minutes talking to you about why this platform Jagnyasa was conceived. We believe India is a civilizational state which prides itself in the spirit of inquiry. It is rooted in dharma and much has much to offer to the world. But over a period of time our ignorance about ourselves has become profound it is this realization that led to the conception of jignasa jignasa's desire is to invoke the spirit of inquiry which can set people on self discovery its aim is to provoke and equip people to see things beyond the limited mainstream discourse on issues of national importance and seek solutions to contemporary issues facing the country It is this desire that led us to host this program along with the Hindu Dharma Charya Sabha titled Hindu Temples and Government Control. One of the distinctive features of protracted Muslim rule in medieval India was the manner in which they impoverished Hindus spiritually, morally, culturally and economically. That legacy continued unabated during the British rule. One would have hoped that things would change under an independent india but nothing really changed congress the party that ruled us for several decades professed a curious brand of secularism which was practiced at the expense of the hindus almost every major legislation in independent india has resulted in successive weakening of the hindu society the hindu temples act was one such legislation that greatly diminished one of the signal glories of hinduism the temple culture in the year 2009 even as the governing body of the tirumala tirupati was facing questions over 300 missing gold coins 
A priest was arrested after confessing to stealing deities two gold necklaces weighing more than a kilo. Governing body officials, however, said that the priest was only a small fry and there was a larger scam that was happening in the Lord Balaji temple, which is in possession of jewelry more than rupees 45,000 crore. No inventory of the temple assets controlled by the government has been done since 2005. An inquiry in July 2008 resulted in suspension of several officials, but the findings were never made public. This is not an isolated instance of misdemeanor. In every corner of the country, from Tamil Nadu to Kashmir, temple managements are fighting the state governments from being taken over by their respective endowment departments. Chilkur Balaji Temple in Hyderabad is an example where the hereditary archers decided to embrace the hundi-less system to prevent the endowments department from taking over the temple administration. The Hindu society often rules that the wealth of Hindu temples is hostage to government interference and corruption. There is angst over inability of Hindu institutions hobbled by government interference to invest in creating knowledge assets, digital, physical universities, and new schools of thought with potential for intergenerational impact. It is not just the government control of temple administrations that is an issue but the sheer disregard of Hindu traditions at the hands of government officials, which is now forcing an enlightened Hindu society to demand absolute religious freedom, including a constitutional right to administer their places of worship and religious institutions. This seminar is also an attempt to revisit the larger debate on how Hindu trust should be managed sans government control, and to determine how devotees can take responsibility towards management of the temples. This is about discussing how Hindu trusts can be made transparent and accountable to the Hindu community. With those words, I welcome you all once again. I have a request, if you feel strongly for the Hindu cause, we are accepting donations. There's a box outside, so please do contribute. After this, I would request Sri Dayanand Saraswati ji to address all of us. Namaskar. I request you all to kindly turn off your cell phones, please. Don't even put it on silent mode because it starts making those buzzing sounds. And then your attention goes to the cell phone instead of what is happening here. Thank you. Uh, we'll start with a small presentation uh, by uh, Sri Ramesh. He's come from Chennai. He belongs to the Temple Worshippers uh, Society of Chennai, doing a lot of work for temples. We'll make all the uh, introductions very short because uh, I think you'd rather hear them than about them. Thank you. Sri Guru Pyo Namaha. Um, before I and my colleague Sri Nagarajan from Temple Shiva Society Chennai start the presentation, I'd just like to say a few words uh, about Temple Shiva Society. It's a lean, clean organization with just eight papers, but you have done a, a lot of work uh, under the society. We have filed more than a thousand <laughs> applications on the RTI, and we have actually received replies to some of them. And we have about the audit reports of 30 temples uh, with the guidance of Dr. Subramaniam Swami we also coordinated the Chidambaram temple case and the judgment which came in the Chidambaram temple is a fantastic judgment. We are, after the Shirur Mat judgment, we have not seen such a good judgment uh, in our favor, in the favor of temples. Uh, I request Sri Nagarajan ji to take the dice. Thank you, Sri Guru Bhyo Namaha, Pooja Swamiji, Acharya Ji, Koti Koti Pranams. Today I see a lot of young faces 
So I would like to start uh, by asking some of my young friends whether they are aware of a dynasty that ruled India called the Mughal dynasty. You know the dynasty? Who was the founder of Mughal dynasty? Babur. Who came after Babur? Humayun. Who came after Humayun? Who came after Akbar? After him? After him? Excellent. Mughal dynasty ruled our country for 300 years, from 1400 to 1700. There's another famous dynasty that also ruled our country for 300 years, from 1325 to some 1650. Who was the founder of this dynasty? It is called Vijayanagara dynasty. <laughs> Sorry? <laughs> Harihara and Bukka. Who came after Harihara and Bukka? Who came after Harihara and Bukka? See, this, this, I have asked this question <clears throat> among many youngsters. Nobody knows anything about Vijayanagara dynasty. The Mughal dynasty has left behind two or three famous Muslims where dead bodies are interned. Taj Mahal, Humayun's tomb, and Nizamuddin. Whereas the Vijayanagara dynasty has left behind literally 10,000 plus temples. And this in essence demonstrates the impact of government control over temples. We have forgotten our heritage. We have forgotten our culture. So without much ado, let me share with you the kind of work we have done at TWS. And I just want to quickly touch upon six major issues on how government control has impacted Hindu temples. There was a huge amount of temp wealth with Hindu temples which has been usurped and looted by the government. As an example, I'll run, I'll, I'll run through this very quickly. We've done some research on specific states. In Tamil Nadu, 39,000 temples own 4.8 lakh acres of land and buildings and sites. And the government collects just 58 crores per month. The market value is 6,000 crores per year, and less than market value. So every year, Roughly 5,950 crores is lost by temples in Tamil Nadu alone. Equal amount in Karnataka perhaps and probably more in Andhra Pradesh and other states. This picture depicts one of the most valuable real estate in Chennai, Boat Club area. A very noble man called Andy Mudaliar left 17 acres for Kapalishwar temple. Entire 17 acres has been occupied by encroachers. The government has left it, they have two acres remaining. How much do they collect from the two acres? Where the land cost is astronomical, we'll run it to some thousands of crores. The government collects exactly rupees 3,000 rupees per month and has given this land on lease for 29 years. We protested and the case is still being heard by the government department. The government since 1850s took over all the land belonging to the temples and said, we'll administer it and give the revenue for the upkeep of temples. That practice has been continuing since the Board of Revenue, the British government, and the Indian government, Congress governments. If you ask them, how well have you administered these lands and what revenue you have delivered to the, to the temples, it turns out that less than 8% of land revenue is being collected only 91% of the other rents are being collected. Abysmal performance. Any corporate world, any manager does this kind of collections, he would be sacked overnight. Yet we allow the government to continue doing this. And the most pathetic part is that the government, in order to collect 58 crores, actually charges the temple 90 crores. I'll come back to it in a moment. Not content with uh, looting the temple wealth, the government also destroys all rites, rituals, and practices. My colleague Ramesh will speak about it. Constitution grants us power to profess, <coughs> uh, propagate our religion. Pro practice, profess, and pra propagate a religion. If you take any ritual, whether it be a priest in Srirangam temple in uh, Srirangam, 
who is carried by the devotees on a specific day as a mark of respect, or it be the Kukke Subramanya Swami uh, ritual, the government always interferes. The government has even deputy commissioners for Kumbha Vishegam, Bala, other uh, uh, temple rituals. Whereas the same government will do nothing about the rituals which are conducted in open streets by other religions, rather they beat themselves with whips and blood comes out, government will not do anything. But government will interfere in rituals conducted inside the Hindu temples. Every year we hear about Puri Jagannath Yatra, there are some controversies. Any ritual, government interferes. The third issue that I want to touch upon is regarding temple architecture. This temple architecture represents a phenomenal deep insight into engineering understanding. All of us are aware that two years ago there was an unfortunate deluge in Kedarnath. Everything was raised, only the temple withstood the onslaught. If you look at the Tanjaur Brahidiswara temple, which was built more than 1,000 years ago, it was built to precise geometric proportions. It is formed of two rectangles, 240 meters by 120 meters. The Shikara is a precise geometrical orientation on the axis. The axis is turned laterally, and the Shikara is exactly half the side of the square at 59.14 meters. It is 1.5 million tons of stones. The smallest stone weighs 300 uh, kgs. This was built 1,000 years ago, and it is standing on a foundation which is less than three meters. And the plumbing is so straight that it has stood for more than 1,000 years, exactly 1,001 years till this date. Very few of us in college, in science or architectural schools, or any other school would ever be taught about the deep engineering expertise of these kind of temples. There's a similar temple in Kalahasti, which also has a very large gopuram, had. And it was again built on a shallow foundation because the engineers are so confident it will stand the test of time. Mindlessly, our government allowed concrete buildings to spring around the temple, hotels and lodges, and all these guys dug deep borewells. And because the borewells had dug, the foundation started collapsing, and the temple tower collapsed and it fell down. This is how we treat heritage structures of 500 years. My heart bleeds when we celebrate 300 years of Chennai, and people talk about the different colonial structures and call it heritage structures. These are heritage structures. Those are not heritage structures. <laughs> and to add insult to injury, there is a temple called Nasiyanu Temple near Erode. This was a mandapam that existed there. Overnight, the government dismantled the entire mandapam and left a big hole. The mandapam was sold off to some anti-collector. And in that hole, they built a concrete structure. And that's how we treat the temple architecture. Let me come to the fourth item, inscriptions. Every temple has enormous number of inscriptions. And these inscriptions are the life history of those times, of the community that lived there, the economic activities, the social structure, the education, the values, all of these are inscribed. On, on the stone walls of the temples. What you see in the picture is a flooring of a temple in, in, near Chennai called Thiruvatriyur. Even the floorings had inscriptions. And these inscriptions talk about how Rajendra Chodan, the king who built the temple, stood on the streets along with common people while the deity was carried along in the procession. Today, we have the modern day Maharajas who are allowed into temples and the deity waits for the Maharaja to come to offer darshan. If that modern day Maharaja is late, the temple doors are closed, it is again opened at midnight so that the modern day Maharaja can have a darshan in Tirupadi. That's how we treat the deities today. The inscriptions tell us that the Maharajas treated the deities with a huge amount of respect and regard. So what the government did, they thought that the inscription to the floor, which had withstood 500 years, were ugly. They uprooted them, and that's what you see on the screen there, threw them out and put marble on the floor. They thought they were making it beautiful. 
some time ago this temple is a poor temple so they put marble on the floor uprooting the inscriptions balaji temple is a rich temple and dr swami has fought hard and long to prevent the balaji temple from gold plating the walls on which inscriptions were there and today of course that has been prevented so every inscription records living history but yet we depend upon the late unlamented, unlamented bipin chandra and irfan habibs and rumila thapers to tell us our history instead of the living uh, inscriptions in our temples this is the uh, sadness to which we have come this is to the extent to which government has reduced us last but uh, uh, one slide here uh, i'm conscious of time the temples are not just place of worship they were the nucleus fulcrum of our knowledge our culture our art till mr mccallay came and overturned the whole thing sometime in 1835 did you know that in 1825 the so called backward most backward classes actually constituted more than 70% of enrollment in schools and colleges under the old vedic system of education that existed there and people today say that they have they were not given the opportunity it's absolute rubbish this is the report of a collector of a british gazette a collector whose survey was published in the gazette and what did they teach if you if you can read the bottom of the line they say they taught astronomy they taught science they taught geography and and medicine that was what was taught in those days in 1825 <clears throat> not only have we allowed the government to destroy our knowledge system by destroying our temples we have even allowed them to destroy our art and culture you know about 1000 years ago we were known to have more than 250 musical instruments of which hardly 5 or 10 survive today the mural that you see there depicting the bharatanatyam kuchipudi and uh, yakshagana all those different dance forms existed thousands of years ago and they depicted as murals this mural that you see here is more than 1000 years old which depicts the fine human form many of you of my age in bangalore would have gone to what is called harikathas that temples used to contact regularly the harikathas not only introduces to the our olden heritage stories they gave us insights into value systems they infused music drama by the government has destroyed all of that by the single minded obsession with controlling the temples <clears throat> last the government has taken out temples and converted temples into a government department what happens when you see a government department first the place becomes filthy it is kept in a very bad fa fashion what you see there is a tiruvaru temple a hall where the famous nataraja idol was taken when tuklak uh, sorry uh, when uh, our local muslim raider raided the chidambaram temple the bikshadas took nataraja idol under the protection of uh, the tanjavur maratha kings took it to tiruvaru temple and put the nataraja in that hall it is called sabapati mandapam the government has reduced it to a another uh, mundane government office by throwing and defiling that place that's how they keep that temple the premises the other thing government does when they take over temples is they say no no you are not manage the temple properly we have to give you a scheme for management so every time they take out temple they announce a scheme what is the scheme the scheme is that you will offer puja swami ji has often told us that you will offer the dt only two bananas for the morning puja for lighting the lamp you will give only 50 paise that is what the scheme says that is how much you will spend and what and because the government is secular therefore they have to act secular <clears throat> i'm skipping some of the slides in interest of time so what the government does is in one instance in chennai what they have done is they have taken over 
they have given on rent the land belonging to a temple to Salvation Army. For 30 years, the Salvation Army has not even paid a rent of 3.5 lakhs. That is what the secular government does. So with these uh, six impact, I hand over to my colleague Ramesh, who will talk about the legal issues that has brought us to this state. Thank you, Nagarajanji. I uh, just wanted to update on the legal initiatives of Pooja Sri Dayananda Sarsidhi Swamiji. Um, the three ways to recover our temples, awareness, legal initiative, and agitation. On 2nd February 2009, the famous single judge judgment on Chidabaram temple was read out. On third morning, Pooja Swamiji called upon Dr. Subramanya Swami and asked him to implead in the case. The rest is history. Uh, what is surprising is, it is not surprising that every state government has 30 to 40,000 temples under their control. What is surprising is, even after the Chidambaram temple judgment, we as Hindus have not done anything to recover the temples. This is the time for action. I uh, leave the dice to Pooja Swamiji and to Dr. Swami to tell us how we may recover our temples from the government control and how we may administer them. Thank you. that we have temples, we cannot manage them. And the government is manned by a lot of Hindus. They are not going to do better.
if the state wants to take over the temples let whole india be declared hindu state we have no issue they say that they are secular i don't understand their secularism <laughs> secular means non interference in religious affairs by the state they interfere and they get votes from all of you on the plea of secularism <laughs> nonsense <laughs> we have filed a case in the supreme court more than more than a year i suppose the states have not replied tamil nadu andhra pandicherry all the three states are involved karnataka is spared no reply reply will come they have to write they have to reply they have to respond if they hand over the temples how will you govern how did they govern before these fellows came into the picture how did they cover cover before if there was a problem you can help them solve the problem subramanian swami has got an argument if they take over because of the lack of good governance they can they get take over for 3 months <laughs> or 3 years te temporary they can't take over and have a department and yes and and appoint a minister and all the money is go to the treasury and and from there they give some pittance for the maintenance of the temple who are these people to give us pittance we maintain ourselves we beg and cover the burden and rama joy says given a beautiful a beautiful plan system to govern the temples he headed the committee of karnataka how to govern the temples he has given and we can improve that and then we will take care of our temples we don't want the government to spend lot of money to the executive officers <laughs> <laughs> the executive officers we had had enough it's time it's time to wake up and let hindus manage the temples the place altars of worship temple is not a hall of assembly it is an altar of worship our hinduism is not a congregational religion
because it is every temple is an altar of worship it may be small it may be big if it is possible we can attach a hall for learning also the altar of worship if we can't take care of the altars of worship we should not have them we should be able to take care of altars of worship therefore bring about this awareness this tamil nadu government overnight took over chidambaram temple against the supreme court judgment that is there allotting the temple for management to the dikshitas for centuries they have been maintaining the temple very beautifully overnight they took over there is a beautiful judgment i requested subramanya swami to file a case in supreme court we are together in all this <laughs> in all over escapades ram setu i did the same thing judgment was brilliant not ordinary brilliant judgment yes super did you read that yes yes you may see the tamil nadu government had to withdraw the whole thing they wanted to build an office and then a toilet within the temple bolna wala pasand hai por ki pasand hai por ki adige we have to bring spare had that's it we will win in the supreme court the case we will win hands down we will win hands down now it is time for subramanya swami we request sri subramanya swami come and address us now pooja swami ji distinguished uh, leaders of the community on the stage ladies and gentlemen there was a time when we were 100% hindu country and at that time people from all over the world who faced persecution came to india for protection the parsis came from iran we looked after them and now they are a distinguished part of our 
society. The Jews came, we built their synagogues for them in Cochin and Bombay, and they lived peacefully here, practiced their religion. When Israel was founded, the first resolution Israeli parliament passed was, thank you India, the only country. They said the only country where the Jews were not persecuted was India. And then today we get lectures on secularism. When we were 100% Hindu, we were secular. So today it's become a fashion to target anything that might become a center of Hindu renaissance. We are given lectures that all religions lead to God. All religions are equal. So I asked Swamiji one day and he gave me this thin book he has written, Do All Religions Have the Same Goal? I advise you to get a copy of this because there the answer is there why Hindu religion is a special religion. <laughs> Hindu religions also says, it's the only religion which says that all religions lead to God. But that doesn't mean that all religions lead to God equally fast. <laughs> you can go by a village road to Bangalore, you can go to by a, by a by a rocket, uh, you can go by thousand ways. So this religion today is in need of a renaissance. And that renaissance can come through temples because temples is where people go in large numbers on their own. And the old temples, it was not only praying to God, but there was a Sanskrit teaching center associated with it, yoga training. So it used, became a center of learning. And that is what ultimately we are aiming at. This country is known as a spiritual country because it is popularly believed that the gods walked on the earth of this country. And whenever we are in a difficulty, we find that somewhere there is a divine intervention. Swamiji one day called me up and said, Ram Setu case you must take up. Well, I was a little apprehensive because it already some people had gone and the Supreme Court had re rejected it. But he said, no, you have my good wishes, go and do it. Well, I found that indeed Ram was protecting Ram Setu. Because as soon as I went to file the case, T.R. Balu, the then shipping minister, brought in a dredger from Holland for 30 crore rupees and tried to break the Ram Setu so there is a fate accompli. Surprise of surprise, the dredger broke into true and fell into the sea. One day, when I was arguing in Supreme Court about Ram Setu, I'm saying all this as a background to what I'm going to tell you about the government and the temples. One day when I was speaking in, Parliament, in the Supreme Court about Ram Setu, referred to Ram Setu as a sacred place for us Hindus, Karunanidhi saw it in the papers next day and reacted very badly. He said, who's Swami to call it Ram Setu? Was Ram an engineer? Which engineering college did he go to? Next day he fell ill. <laughs> and he had to be admitted to the hospital. And the hospital's name was Ramchandraji Medical <laughs> College. 
Ramchandra Medical Hospital is a very well-known hospital in Madras. So I wrote him a get well letter and said, pray to God that Ramchandra ji has an MBBS. <laughs> there is no bar to the government of India or the state government taking over not the temple or any other religious institution but the administration of the same. It's wrong to say government has taken over temples. They cannot under the constitution, article 25 and 26. And I will say that today government has only in the last 67 years taken over temples. And even before during the British period, they have not taken over the religious institutions of the Muslims and the Christians. Somebody filed a, a petition once in, in Supreme Court saying that this is discrimination. Supreme Court said, who's stopping you from taking over Islamic institutions and Christian institutions? We have not stopped anybody. The law provides, the constitution provides, you can do so. It's the which only focused on the Hindu temples. Well, I hope the Narendra Modi government will correct that imbalance. <laughs> it's not a hope just only, but I know that we will do that. But I want you to understand one thing, that temple is not like a masjid. Temple is not like a church. Why? I was surprised in the United States, there were many churches which were in disuse. And the Vishwanda Parishad was buying them and converting them into temples. So I asked uh, one American friend of mine who was a Christian that don't you mind that our people are taking over temple, uh, churches and converting them into temples? He said, no, once the cross is removed from a church, it's just a building, so you can buy, no problem. <laughs> so as far as the church is concerned, it's not in the same status as a temple. I explained to you why the temple is different. Similarly, a masjid. I had a friend, I have a friend who is now the number three in Saudi Arabia. He had come here to have dinner, dinner. I mean he invited me for dinner, one-to-one -one dinner. And I had seen in the papers that they were demolishing a number of mosques to build roads. So I asked him, uh, you're demolishing mosques to build roads? He said, yes, we do it sometimes to build apartment buildings and all. I said, don't uh, your citizens object? He said, mosque is just a building. It's a facilitation center to read namaz. It can be built anywhere and namaz can be read anywhere. So I told him that means I can also demolish masjids in our country. He said, yes, but do it with a little of love, but not. <laughs> but it can be done. So I think it should be on the agenda that within the next five years, Mathura temple, Ayodhya temple, and Kashi Vishwana temple should be restored to its old glory. And we'll build a masjid somewhere else. We will spend money of the government to build a masjid somewhere else. And they should accept it. In fact, uh, let me tell you, the government of India told a constitutional bench in 1994, in the famous case of Faruqi versus the Union of India, 
that if the court asked, the bench asked, the constitutional bench asked the government, what's your solution? And they said that if it can be shown that in the area where the Babri Masjid stood, there was a pre-existing temple before, we will hand over this property to the Hindus to do what they want to do. This is an affidavit. Of course, it was Narsimha Rao government. And the Narsimha Rao government was not like the Nehru type government. So he gave this. In 2002, the Allahabad High Court ordered a commission to be set up, asked the ASI, the Archaeological Survey of India, to find out whether there was an existing temple. And they used GPS and all the modern techniques and then dug up the place accordingly and found that indeed there was a temple below the masjid site. So now the government of India is bound because you gave an assurance to the court. I jokingly wrote to, the, to, Manmo, uh, to uh, Narendra Modi that if you do not now build a Ram temple, I'll have to file a contempt petition against your government. <laughs> There's a legal way to build these temples. So I will begin with this background, that for us, temple is once built, can never be put into disuse. I mean, that is, you cannot demolish it. You cannot scavenge it. When I was law minister in 1991, there was a case of a Nataraj statue, which in Tanjavur was discovered by a farmer. The touts came, paid him some money, took it to London. And there, they decided to auction it. At that time, this matter was brought to my attention of all the people, Mr. Rajiv Gandhi, who said that something should be done about it. This is a, I was in that time, the government of Chandrasekhar, which was supported from the outside by Mr. Rajiv Gandhi in the Congress. So I took it up, did some study, and I found that once a temple is built after a prana pratishta puja, it shall forever remain a temple. The argument used by the auctioneers was that this Nataraja statue came from a temple which was in disuse. And therefore, the argument we advanced is, even if it was in disuse, once the Prana Pratishta Puja takes place, the deity, in this case Lord Shiva, or in the case of Ayodhya, Rama, enters the statue and the deity becomes the owner of the temple and we can only be the trustees. And the House of Lords in 1991 ruled, return the statue of Nataraja because a temple is always a temple even if it is in disuse. Now it is in this context I want to tell you how to free all our temples from the control of the government. Swamiji's petition is already pending in the Supreme Court. And a fallout of the Sri Sabha temple case where I was successful in, in getting it uh, restored back to the Dikshitas. It wouldn't have been possible without the blessings of Swami Dayan and Saraswati. Because when he phoned me up and said, you take up this case, I said, how I can take up this case? I am not, I am not, uh, you know, Dikshitar. And uh, secondly, you see, what is my locus standi? And furthermore, I didn't appear in the single bench of the High Court. How will, I am not even named as a petitioner in the 
appeal to the division bench. Now the matter can go to Supreme Court. Supreme Court will say, who are you? Why have you come? I have to explain. He said, no, no, you have my blessings. You go and appear. So I went and filed. And the first thing the judge asked me is, in what capacity are you here? I produced Swamiji's letter to me, appointing me as the legal counsel of the Hindu Dharma Acharya Sabha. The judge read it and he said, yes, you are the petitioner. So that's the power of the blessings of our truly spiritual people, that what doesn't seem possible becomes possible. First of all, I want to say to you that the Constitution, Article 25 and 26, treats it as a fundamental right to practice religion according to your free will, subject to, this is the important part, subject to restrictions arising from morality, public order, public health. So therefore, any religious practice which violates any of these three can be subject to a, uh, a government control. Now, what happens is that so far the government has been going into the question of how to, uh, to take over a control because in the name of financial mismanagement. Well, they must make out a case that there is financial mismanagement. Generally, they don't, don't do. And the, our pujaris and priests, they are too timid to fight the government. And so, today, four and a half lakh temples are in the control of government all over India. In Tamil Nadu, it is about 46,000. And they have been looted, they have been deprived of their land, they have been subjected to great misery. So, therefore, the issue becomes, how long can you take over a temple? So, I argued that under the article, under Article 31 of the Constitution, a government can only take over any property which the Supreme Court in another judgment has interpreted to mean including temples. Government can take over any property only for a limited period. And I defined to the court that the limited period should be only three years. The Savanayagar's judgment does not specify the period, but does say limited period. And therefore, take Tirupati. It has been taken over 1933. 81 years have passed by. So if I go with the petition today to the Supreme Court saying that Tirupati should be returned back to his trustees, the Supreme Court will allow it. But who are the trustees, I don't know. They say some Hatiram trust is, is there. But there is a dispute. This is part of the problem with the Hindus. We have always have disputes. I think that the Hindu Dharma Acharya Sabha should be entrusted with all the temples and then they should distribute it to the rightful owners. Or a Dharmic Parishad should be created by the government. That is being considered today. So therefore, every temple, once the financial management or the administrative flaws discovered in a well-investigated report before it is taken over is cured and must be cured within three years, then automatically it should go back to the trustees. Government cannot do anything more than that. It cannot take over a temple. In fact, when people, the Shastris, the Pujaris of Tirupati came to me saying that the, the governing or the board which has been uh, appointed by the government of Andhra Pradesh to oversee the administration 
has now decided to make Tirupati into a golden temple and that there will be gold plating and those plating will cover the walls where there are lots of carvings with a lot of details like what Naivedyam should be composed of, how it should be made, all kinds of details should be covered by gold and this would be great act of injustice. I spoke to the chairman, then chairman, Adi Kesavalu, and I said, how can you do this? You're going to cover it up? He said, no, but I've taken a video, and I'm putting the video in a CD in the museum. Then I said, you might as well also have a video of the Archana and put it there so that nobody needs to go for Archana. <laughs> what do you mean, video? I said, changing the character of the temple is not within your power. And went back to the court and said that they have now interfering in the, the, the shape of the temple itself. And that's an interference in the religious affairs of the Hindus. Well, Court asked me, who can then rectify a situation if there is a malfunction in the religious functions? I said, the Agama Shastris, they are there in Tirupati. Or you call all the big saints of our country and ask them. But not the government of India. And that was accepted. So let me tell you that if any complaint comes to you that some government is interfering or some officer appointed for the job, the EO, the executive officer is interfering, like putting up a toilet right in the middle of the temple. I don't know what was the urgency to have a toilet there, but maybe there was a contract and was, the minister was going to get a commission for building a toilet, I don't know. But we stopped it because that would be interference in the temple affairs. So the picture today is very clear. The day the Hindu community is ready to run its own temples, we can restore all four and a half lakh temples back to the people. You see, I would like to say that temples are, as I say, the focus, the fulcrum, the epicenter of Hindu Renaissance. That's where people of all different castes, communities, regions come. Whether the Tamils go to Pashupati Nath or the Northerners come to Rameshwaram, that particular act is done as a resident of Hindustan, as one people. And therefore we promote it. But let us not also forget, as the introductory speaker said, our Hindu history. I had a student from Saudi Arabia once who, at Harvard University, he asked me, can you explain to me why India is still 80% Hindu? I said, what is wrong with that? He said, you see, Islam went to Persia. The Zoroastrians were ruling. In 15 years, we converted Persia into 100% Islamic country and named it Iran. Neighboring areas, two countries, Mesopotamia, Babylon, we conquered it, unified it, called it Iraq, and in 17 years, we made it 100% Muslim. Egypt, in 21 years, we made it 100% Muslim after conquest. Christians conquered Europe in 50 years, they made it 100% Christian. But in your country, 800 years rule of Hindu Muslims and 200 years rule of Christians, and you're still 80% Hindu, what is the secret? And the secret is what we don't know as history. Every part of India kept fighting. As he pointed out, Vijayanagara Empire. He said that Mughal was 300. I say the real Mughal was from Akbar to Aurangzeb, and that's only 150 years. Whereas this Vijayanagaram spread right to the borders of Bengal. 
and it lasted for 300 years, produced a massive renaissance, built temples all over. And you see history books, one paragraph. In South India, there was a kingdom called Vijayanagar. You ask even Kannadis, who is Rani Chennamma? I don't know how many people know. Ask the modern DMK types in Tamil Nadu who is Kataboman, they won't know. But look at our country which has worshipped even losers because they showed courage to defend the dharma. <laughs> Rana Pratap had to go to the forest and eat chapatis made out of dried grass. But he is a hero. His cousin brother Man Singh lived in palace of Jaipur. People spit on his name. Rani Jhansi. She did not lead you to victory, heroine, Subhash Chandra Bose. Because this country <laughs> felt that the struggle, the courage to struggle was the most important quality somebody can have. And that's why Shivaji, the great victor, and Rana Pratap, Guru Gobind Singh, who are considered as great heroes. This is the tradition. 46 civilizations have been tabulated, 45 have disappeared. Only surviving continuing civilization, the Hindu civilization. It has, we have been brainwashed to think of all kinds of things which are not true about our history. This Aryan Dravidian theory, bogus theory. The DNA says we are all the same. And people have got all kinds of cockeyed impressions. Karnanidhi once told me that Ravan, I asked him why so many DK people are having the name Ravanan. He says, Rama name we will not have. Ravanan was our Tamil Dravida king. Then I did some research. I found that Ravan was born in the outskirts of Delhi in a place called Noida. I even located the village where he was born. Even today there's a signboard there, Ravan was born here. He went to Mansarovar, he did uh, tapas, got a varam from uh, Lord Shiva, and then he said, which is the most prosperous area? And he found that it was Sri Lanka under Guber. He came and conquered it and became its king. I also discovered that Ravan was a Brahmin. So I told Karnanidhi, that you are worshipping a Brahmin, since when? <laughs> Nowadays he doesn't talk about Ravan anymore. <laughs> These are the cockeyed histories that we have been fed in to think of us as people who are not indigenous to this place. But now the modern theory of genetics says that we are one people. Top to bottom, Brahmins and scheduled caste have the same DNA. Hindus and Muslims have the same DNA. And it's all a question of opportunities. I've always been surprised, you see, the way we have been prejudiced. Dr. Ambedkar was a scheduled caste, went to, Cambridge, uh, to uh, Columbia, got a PhD in economics. It was a classic thesis. He went later on to England and got a law degree, came to India, led the constitutional debate as the chairman of the drafting committee. And congressman referred to Ambedkar as Bhim Rao. Jawaharlal Nehru went to Cambridge and failed. <laughs> of course, every member of the Nehru family has failed. He came back to India and our people started calling him Pandit Jawaharlal Nehru. <laughs> you can call Ambedkar Pandit Jambedkar. But Jawaharlal Nehru Pandit? This is the prejudice that has been fed into our brain. And Hindu Renaissance requires this liberation of the mind. And in that, the liberation of the, uh, the temples 
is a crucial part. And I can assure you, within this term of the BJP, all the temples will come back. For, for, that, for that, we need a central act that supersedes all the state acts. And in my opinion, under the Constitution, it is permitted because temple, uh, temple management of its administration is a concurrent subject. States can legislate, but the center can also legislate, and the center can legislate a superseding legislation. And I think it's time now to bring all the temples into one national policy for which I must congratulate uh, Ms. Vijayalakshmi for holding this uh, conference, this meeting. I thought she made very good idlis, but I didn't know she's such a good organizer also. <laughs> so I think this, this movement must continue. We must press ahead with the blessings of all the spiritual people of our country. Um, I get sometimes, uh, I feel uh, difficulty when I, I'm sitting with all these great spiritual leaders and I'm called Swami. <laughs> <laughs> but, well, um, in fact, when I go to America, there's such a craze for Swamiji's that they see my name in the telephone directory and call me and ask me to come and give a discourse in Bhagavad Gita. When I say, no, I won't, they think I'm haggling for the fees, so they double my fees also. <laughs> the world over today, people are searching for happiness and they think that India has the answers. <laughs> world over. <laughs> world over, people are now thinking that if you want to improve your health, you must do yoga. And yoga has now become universal. Now we find that the NASA has said, whoever wants to study artificial intelligence, they must learn Sanskrit because this Sanskrit is the only language. <laughs> Sanskrit is the only language which is computer friendly. And is widespread. And it, you, every language of India has Sanskrit words. So this country, which was once upon a time a spiritual guru, will become once again a guru for which the temple renaissance is an essential part. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, sir. We are now going to have a session of question and answers. We have written questions here. I know all of you are very eager to have your questions answered, but unfortunately, time and tide waits for no man, so the clock is just ticking. And uh, Pooja Swamiji has to leave at six, and I think uh, Subramaniam Swamiji and the rest of the Swamis can stay another half an hour. So. <laughs> And so uh, we'll, we have the questions here, and there are several questions that uh, are similar. So we will not be announcing your names, because you know we'd rather have more questions than spend the time in saying who asked the question. And I'm really sorry that some, I know all of you wanted to meet all of them individually, and we had to keep saying, I'm sorry, we can't. I hope you understand why we couldn't allow you to meet them individually. Because you know the, their time is for everybody. So we'll start with the question and answers now. And uh, I have to say one thing, that every one of them here has very spontaneously come here, and it's just their blessings that we've been able to pull this pro program off. We could never have done it without them. In fact, we had many other Swamiji's that we asked, but it being Chaturmasya, many of them don't move out of their ashrams. So many of them, their representatives are here, and they've all asked us for uh, a report on what is going on. I have to say, I would like to say it now, two words on uh, the Hindu Dharma Acharya Sabha. This is uh, the apex body of Hindu religious leaders. 
It's the brainchild of Swami Dayanand Saraswati Ji. And uh, I, uh, I personally know how difficult it has been for him to bring all the Matadipatis together under one roof. I know one problem of Hindu society is unity. I hope the next time also we have numbers like this and we have to conduct it in some other big hall. And uh, I would appreciate that all of you kindly please support us, not just with your uh, moral support, but with some financial aid because all this costs a lot. And if you want us to arrange more things like this, we need the money. I'm sorry I have to say this. There's a donation box outside. Please donate generously. I'll hand it over to Supriya now to take the question answer session. Thank you. Namaste to all the lovers of Sanatana Dharma, Pooja Swamiji is on the dais, and all the other dignitaries on stage. The first question this evening is addressed to Sri 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 Nirmalanandanatha Swamiji. E Hosa Pidige. ದೇವಸ್ಥಾನಗಳಿಂದ ಶಾಲೆಗಳು ಮತ್ತು ಮಹಾವಿದ್ಯಾಲಯಗಳನ್ನು ಏಕೆ ನಿರ್ಮಾಣ ಮಾಡಿ ಕಟ್ಟಬಾರದು ಅಂತ ಕೇಳ್ತಾ ಇದ್ದಾರೆ ಸ್ವಾಮೀಜಿ ವೈ ಆರ್ ನಾಟ್ ಸ್ಕೂಲ್ಸ್ ಅಂಡ್ ಕಾಲೇಜಸ್ ಬೀಂಗ್ ಬಿಲ್ಟ್ ಬೈ ಟೆಂಪಲ್ಸ್ ಫಾರ್ ದ ನ್ಯೂ ಜನರೇಷನ್ ಮಠಗಳು ಮತ್ತು ದೇವಸ್ಥಾನಗಳು ಆಧುನಿಕ ವಿದ್ಯಾಶಾಲೆಗಳನ್ನು ಯಾಕೆ ಪ್ರಾರಂಭಿಸಬಾರದು ರೈಟ್ ಪ್ರಾಯಶಃ ಒಟ್ಟು ಭಾರತ ಅಖಂಡ ಭಾರತದಲ್ಲಿ ಬೇರೆ ಬೇರೆ ರಾಜ್ಯಗಳನ್ನು ನಾವು ನೋಡಿದ್ದೇ ಆದರೆ ನಮ್ಮ ಕನ್ನಡ ನಾಡಿನಲ್ಲಿ ಕರ್ನಾಟಕದಲ್ಲಿ ಇರುವಂಥ ಮಠ ಮಂದಿರಗಳು ಮಠ ಮಾನ್ಯಗಳು ತೆರೆದಿರುವಷ್ಟು ಶಾಲಾ ಕಾಲೇಜುಗಳನ್ನು ಬೇರಾವ ರಾಜ್ಯದಲ್ಲಿ ಕೂಡ ನಾವು ಕಂಡದಿಲ್ಲ ಎಕ್ಸಾಕ್ಟ್ಲಿ ಇಟ್ ಇಸ್ ಇನ್ ಕರ್ನಾಟಕ ಮಟ್ಸ್ ಹ್ಯಾವ್ ಓಪನ್ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ಎಸ್ಟಾಬ್ಲಿಷ್ಡ್ so many education institutions do matter of ancient nature understanding the needs of the time and the society karnataka mats have established so many education institutions they are not only of modern in nature do these institutions have been imbibing modern education system in the minds of the children they have been imbibing our spiritual values also as is known to everybody tens of mats are there under whom hundreds of education institutions are running for example if you take i am the one the mat with i have been representing adi chinchanagiri though ours is ancient adi chinchaniri religious mart which has east of 1500 years we have established more than 475 education institutions under which 125000 students are taking an education as far as the education aspect is concerned not only the modern education system we have been imbibing we have been teaching spiritual values also it is right as we sanyasis smart temples are in midst of society if we fail to respond to the call of the society and the time ultimately we are going to become outdated the question is right it is our bounded duty to do that fortunate that karnataka mats have been doing so we have to encourage mats of other states also to do so thank you thank you swami ji the next question is for Pooja Swamiji Shri Dayananda Saraswati. There is a question here, Swamiji. This person says, how do we stop intersectarian hatred and unite Hinduism in temples? Thank you. 
Let me repeat the question. How do we stop intersectarian hatred and unite yeah, no. Hinduism in temples? It's not easy. Even to answer is not easy. I thought this intercaste rivalry is almost over. The the understanding we have to bring about some understanding. that we are Hindus, we worship the same deity, we share everything that is our, our beliefs, believe in karma. This Common things have to be brought to the people. What is common? The emphasis should be on Hinduism. That will blot out this kind of rivalries. More often than not, the rivalries start from some kind of ego and greed. It's not inter-caste rivalry. It's a personal rivalry. Sometimes they convert it into casteism. So, the best solution is education. Make them all Hindus. Hindus have to be made Hindus. Hindus are Mandus. <laughs> they have to be made. They have to be made Hindus. That's the only way. Mundina Prashne, Pujya Swamiji, Shri Vidyabhinava Shankara Bharati Swamiji, Avarikalikri. Prashne, Intaha Karyakramagalu, Atava, Intaha Chalu Alikegalu, Idarali Navu Hege Paripurna Vagi, Bhagava Hisabhudu, Namma Sanatana Dharma Koskaravagi. How can we actively participate? at such agendas and such programs in the progress of Sanatana Dharma. Pratyobhrigu namma namma dharma galiye namma hindu dharma dhamele abhimanu nitkondu abhimanu dhe namma vandu dharma dhe utkarishakkagi Kalo Sanghe, Balam Balam, Ambon Town, the other in day. Now Sanghitit Ragabekun Tandre, a Sanghitan early Namag Abhimana Bekagote, a Abhimana the Jute Lee, Namag on the Ekate Beku, a Ekate in day, even do in Tha Abhimana Nirbana Beku, Hitchin Pramada de Lavalas, Kurko Beku. Kutundu is the Vishayun and Niskarish Madra Matre Ali Undu Aitra Bhagwesi Undu Navinu Output and Chertevi, and then a Faragat the Pitu Avon the Rinde, Undu Sanghitan in Madi, Namadharma, Namarashtra, Namasamskirti, 
ಈ ವಿಚಾರವಾಗಿ ಹೆಚ್ಚಿನ ತಿಳುವಳಿಕೆಯನ್ನು ಕೊಟ್ಟು ಜನರಲ್ಲಿ ಹೆಚ್ಚಿನ ಒಂದು ಪ್ರೇಮ ಮತ್ತು ಅಭಿಮಾನವನ್ನು ನಿರ್ಮಾಣ ಮಾಡುವಂಥದ್ದಾಗಬೇಕು ಇದರಲ್ಲಿ ತ್ಯಾಗ ಮತ್ತು ಪ್ರೇಮ ಇವೆರಡೂ ಅತ್ಯಂತ ಅವಶ್ಯಕವಿದೆ ಯಾವುದೇ ಜಾತಿಯಾಗಲಿ ಯಾವುದೇ ಇದು ಆಗಲಿ ಅದನ್ನು ನಾವು ಎಣಿಸಲಾರ್ದೇ ಸಂಪೂರ್ಣವಾಗಿ ನಾವು ತತ್ವಗಳ ಆಧಾರದ ಮೇಲೆ ನಾವು ಈ ಒಂದು ನಮ್ಮ ವಿಚಾರವನ್ನು ನಾವು ಜನರಿಗೆ ಬೋಧ ಮಾಡಿ ಒಂದು ಸಂಘಟನೆಯನ್ನು ತೊಗೊಂಬಂದು ಇಲ್ಲಿ ಆ ತತ್ವಗಳ ವಿಚಾರವನ್ನು ಜಾಸ್ತಿ ತಿಳ್ಕೋಬೇಕು ಎಂಬ ಉದ್ದೇಶದಿಂದೇ ನಾವು ಈ ಒಂದು ಇದನ್ನು ಕೂಡ್ಕೊಳ್ಳುವಂಥದ್ದು ಒಂದು ಯೋಜನೆಯನ್ನು ನಾವು ಮ್ಯಾನೇಜ್ ಮೇಲೆ ಹಾಕಬೇಕಾಗ್ತದೆ ಇದರಲ್ಲಿ ನಾವು ಮೇನಿನ ಮೇಲೆ ಈ ರೀತಿಯಾಗಿರ್ತಕ್ಕಂಥ ಒಂದು ಸತ್ಸಂಗ ಈ ರೀತಿಯಾಗಿರ್ತಕ್ಕಂಥ ಒಂದು ಯೋಜನೆಗಳನ್ನು ಹಾಕಿ ಮಾಡೋದರಿಂದ ಸಂಘಟನೆ ಮೇಲಿನ ಮೇಲೆ ಜಾಸ್ತಿ ಬೆಳೀತಾ ಹೋಗ್ತದೆ ಅವಾಗ ಹಿಂದೂಗಳಲ್ಲಿ ಏಕತೆ ಮನೋಭಾವನ ಬೆಳೀಲಿಕ್ಕೆ ಸಾಧ್ಯ ಆಗುತ್ತೆ ಅದಕ್ಕೆ ಈ ಏಕತೆಯಲ್ಲಿ ತನಕ ಬೆಳೆಯೋದಿಲ್ಲವೋ ಎಲ್ಲಿವರೆಗೂ ನಮ್ಮ ಮನಸ್ಸಿನಲ್ಲಿ ಸಂಕುಚಿತ ಮನೋಭಾವನ ಹೋಗೋದಿಲ್ಲವೋ ಅಲ್ಲಿವರೆಗೂ ಈ ರೀತಿಯಾಗಿ ನಮಗೆ ಕೂಡಲಿಕ್ಕೆ ಸಾಧ್ಯ ಆಗೋದಿಲ್ಲ ಇಷ್ಟೆಲ್ಲ ಜನ ಬಂದಾರೆ ಅಂತಂದರೆ ಒಂದು ಆ ಸ್ವಾಮೀಜಿಯಲ್ಲಿರ್ತಕ್ಕಂಥ ಒಂದು ಅಭಿಮಾನ ನಮ್ಮ ಸಂಸ್ಕೃತಿ ಮೇಲೆ ನಮ್ಮ ದೇವಸ್ಥಾನಗಳ ಮೇಲೆ ಇರತಕ್ಕಂಥ ಅಭಿಮಾನ ಇದೆ ಅಂಥೇಳಿ ಇಷ್ಟು ಜನ ಎಲ್ಲರೂ ಇವತ್ತು ನಾವು ಒಟ್ಟಿಗೆ ಕೂಡಿರ್ತೇವೆ ಈ ಕಾರಣಕ್ಕಾಗಿ ಎಲ್ಲೂ ತತ್ವಗಳ ಆಧಾರದ ಮೇಲೆ ನಾವು ಒಂದು ಸಂಘಟನೆಯನ್ನು ಮಾಡಿ ನಮಗೆ ವಿಚಾರಗಳಕ್ಕಿಂತ ತತ್ವದ ಆಧಾರದ ಮೇಲೆ ನಾವು ಇದನ್ನು ಮಾಡ್ಕೊಂಡ್ಬಿಟ್ಟು ಆ ಸಂಘಟನೆಯನ್ನು ಬೆಳೆಸಿ ನಮ್ಮ ಸಂಸ್ಕೃತಿ ಉಳಿಸಿ ಅದನ್ನು ಬೆಳೆಸೋದಕ್ಕೆ ನಾವು ಪೋಷಕರಾಗಲಿಕ್ಕೆ ಮುಂದೆ ಬರಬೇಕಾಗ್ತದೆ ಧನ್ಯವಾದಗಳು ಸ್ವಾಮೀಜಿ The next question is addressed to Justice Shri Rama Joyes. From the Trivandrum Temple, the former Muslim RBI Deputy Governor allowed money to be mined, yet there was no case that was filed against him. I repeat the question. From the Trivandrum Temple, the former muslim rbi deputy governor allowed money to be mined from the temple coffers yet there was no case that was filed against him why according to me dharmic power is more powerful than even atomic power because if dharmic power was operated america would not have put uh, atom bomb on hiroshima and nagasaki they are lacking in dharma dharma is supreme that is why mahanarayana upanishad says dharma dharme dharma is supreme why dharme na papam apanadati say i have been a lawyer and a judge what is difference between law and dharma law in comes into operation after the offense is committed law can punish the offender but dharma can prevent the person from committing the offense <laughs> that is why it is called dharmena papam upanadati tasmat dharmam paramam vadanti therefore and dharma dharmic power which is the generating station these are the temples constitute the generating station of dharmic power and it because of that it is not out maharana pratap shivaji and so many army people they have said but ultimately our culture our dharma is saved only by this temple there are rajmani uh, sitaram goel from delhi has published a public book called hindu temples what happened to them as many as 30000 temples were destroyed by invaders but still there were lakhs of temples and it is those temples which ca- constitute the point of honor or shraddha of our people and so long as temples are strong dharma will continue to be strong aravind in his uh, uttarapara speech as 1905 he said dharma will remain supreme then our rashtra nation also will supreme if dharma declines nation declines therefore he says we must at all costs protect dharma and which will in turn protect our nation and according to me this 
temples will protect our dharma and so long temples are quite strong and working our dharma like that nainam chintan sheshanaani nainam dahati pavaka nainam klodayantya po na shoshayati marna dharma cannot be destroyed just like atma dharma is ra- atma of our rashtra it cannot be destroyed at all there may sometimes it may be declining sometimes it may be uh, very power glorious but still dharma is like our atma it cannot be destroyed and it sure and the very fact that so many people and so many so many are present here is a complete proof dharma is going to again emerge again and uh, take the, uh, our nation to pinnacle of glory thank you so much sir the next question that is addressed is to shri subramaniam swami if a if a pernicious draft like the cvb could get wide publicity why can't we draft a bill of rights for hindu temples and get it debated and legislated what are the barriers what cvb communal violence bill oh cvb well first of all the cvb is dead and now you got a government which is responsive to hindus so we don't have to draft anything just tell me what you want and i will get some member of parliament to do it so there is one more question to you which i think you can take right now can the acharyas today declare one day in the year as a release all temples from government control day when where hindus all over india can protest collectively i think on one day all the acharyas should assemble in ramlila ground and say today is the day we begin the liberation of all temples from government control <laughs> after that after that we will take over and you will not have to do anything more the next question will be to pooja swami shivayogi swami ji the question to you is can we have a dedicated mainstream news channel by hindus to counter the false propaganda in the current mainstream media to swami shweyog what would be the challenges for establishing such a channel ನಮ್ಮ ಹಲವಾರು ವಾರ್ತಾ ವಾಹಿನಿಗಳಿವೆ ಸಾಕಷ್ಟು ನ್ಯೂಸ್ ಚಾನೆಲ್ ಇವೆ ಅದರಲ್ಲಿ ಒಂದು ವಾಹಿನಿ ಇದಕ್ಕಾಗಿಯೇ ಅಂದರೆ ನಮ್ಮ ಹಿಂದೂ ಹಾಗೂ ವೇದ ತತ್ವಗಳ ಬಗ್ಗೆ ಕಂಟಿನ್ಯೂಸ್ ಆಗಿ ಅದನ್ನು ಅದರ ಬಗ್ಗೆ ಮಾಹಿತಿಗಳನ್ನ ನೀಡುವಂತಹ ಒಂದು ವಾಹಿನಿ ಯಾಕಿರಬಾರ್ದು ಅಥವಾ ಈ ಥರ ಒಂದು ವಾಹಿನಿನ ನಿರ್ವಹಿಸೋದಕ್ಕೆ ಏನು ಕಾರಣಗಳಿದೆ ಅಥವಾ ಏನು ತೊಂದರೆಗಳಿದೆ ಇವತ್ತು ಭಾರತೀಯ ಸಂಸ್ಕೃತಿ ಬಹಳ ಶ್ರೇಷ್ಠವಾಗಿರುವಂಥದ್ದು ಭಾಳ ಪವಿತ್ರವಾಗಿರುವಂಥದ್ದು ಬಹುಶಃ ನಮ್ಮ ಭಾರತದ ಸಂಸ್ಕೃತಿಯನ್ನು ಇನ್ಯಾವುದೇ ದೇಶಕ್ಕೆ ಹೋಲಿಸಲಿಕ್ಕೆ ಆಗೋದಿಲ್ಲ ಅಂಥ ಸಂಸ್ಕೃತಿಯನ್ನು ಬಿತ್ತರಿಸುವುದಕ್ಕಾಗಿ ಒಂದು ಚಾನಲ್ ನಮಗೆ ಅತ್ಯಂತ ಅವಶ್ಯಕವಾಗಿರುವಂಥದ್ದು ಇವತ್ತು ಬೇಕೇ ಬೇಕು ನಮಗೆ ಯಾಕೆಂದರೆ ನಮ್ಮ ಭಾರತೀಯ ಸಂಸ್ಕೃತಿ ಪಾಶ್ಚಿಮಾತ್ಯ ಸಂಸ್ಕೃತಿ ನಮ್ಮ ಸಂಸ್ಕೃತಿಯನ್ನು ಹಾಳು ಮಾಡುವಂಥ ಒಂದು ವ್ಯವಸ್ಥೆ ಇವತ್ತು ಆರಂಭ ಆಗಿರುವಂಥದ್ದು ಆ ಕಾರಣಕ್ಕೆ ಇವತ್ತು ನಮಗೆ ಭಾರತೀಯ ಸಂಸ್ಕೃತಿ ಉಳಿಯಬೇಕಾದರೆ ಇವತ್ತು ಮಾಧ್ಯಮ ಭಾಳ ಅವಶ್ಯಕತೆ ಇದೆ ಇವತ್ತು ಯಾವುದೇ ಏನಾದರೂ ಹೊಸದು ಆರಂಭ ಆದರೆ ಪ್ರಾಯಃ ಅದರಲ್ಲಿ ಬರುವಂಥ ಒಂದು ವ್ಯವಸ್ಥೆಯನ್ನು ಅನುಕರಣೆ ಮಾಡುವಂಥ ಯುವಜನಾಂಗ ಭಾಳ ಹೆಚ್ಚಾಗಿದೆ ಆ ಕಾರಣದಿಂದ ಇವತ್ತು ಭಾರತೀಯ ಸಂಸ್ಕೃತಿಯನ್ನು 
ನಮ್ಮ ಪರಂಪರೆಯನ್ನು ನಮ್ಮ ಒಂದು ವ್ಯವಸ್ಥೆಯನ್ನು ಉಳಿಸಿಕೊಳ್ಬೇಕಾದ್ರೆ ನಮ್ಮ ಜಾನಪದದ ಒಂದು ಸಂಪ್ರದಾಯವನ್ನು ನಾವು ಉಳಿಸ್ಕೊಳ್ಬೇಕಾದ್ರೆ ಇವತ್ತು ನಮಗೆ ಒಂದು ಒಂದು ಧಾರ್ಮಿಕವಾಗಿ ಒಂದು ಚಾನಲ್ ಅತ್ಯಂತ ಅವಶ್ಯಕ ಅನ್ನುವಂಥದ್ದು ನನ್ನ ಅಭಿಪ್ರಾಯ ಧನ್ಯವಾದಗಳು ಸ್ವಾಮೀಜಿ ದ ನೆಕ್ಸ್ಟ್ ಕ್ವೆಶನ್ ಇಸ್ ಅಡ್ರೆಸ್ ಟು ಶ್ರೀ ಎಂ ವಿ ಸೌಂದರಾಜನ್ ಇಫ್ ನಾಟ್ ದ ಗವರ್ಮೆಂಟ್ ಟು ಕಂಟ್ರೋಲ್ ಟೆಂಪಲ್ ವಾಟ್ ಇಸ್ ದ ನೆಕ್ಸ್ಟ್ ಬೆಸ್ಟ್ ಆಲ್ಟರ್ನೇಟ್ ಸೊಲ್ಯೂಷನ್ ಟು ದಿಸ್ ಇಫ್ ನಾಟ್ ದ ಗವರ್ಮೆಂಟ್ ಟು ಹೋಲ್ಡ್ ಕಂಟ್ರೋಲ್ ಓವರ್ ದ ಟೆಂಪಲ್ಸ್ what is the next best alternative system for this <clears throat> namaste they say you have put a very important question to me chilkur balaji temple located near hyderabad has become famous Pooja Swamiji is leaving by 6 o'clock and some more questions will be asked, many people will reply. My only ambition is that Swamiji knows me very well and Swamiji should know what is that we have achieved. I am speaking with a sense of achievement what we have done one important thing because i have given a commitment to a very important leader today while coming here justice ramajai ji is just by my side and he promoted the concept of dharmika parishad before it was implemented in karnataka i took it and gave it to the principal secretary to the government from the airport i went and gave and he was so impressed with that and he immediately made that recommendation to the joint select committee which all the political parties were involved and they gave a unanimous recommendation that the dharmika parishad should be established accordingly the dharmika parishad was established and it was doing human service but unfortunately with the maximum pain i have to say that yesterday that dharmika parishad has been scrapped in the new state of andhra pradesh that is the residuary state why i have mentioned it because while coming the leader of the opposition in the legislative council he spoke to me because he knows about this particular conference he told me that i have spoken in the council today the importance of dharmika parishad enduku chesaraya most of you know telugu enduku chesaraya inta apavadu inta avacharo dr sumbrabanya swami ji i request you to kindly hear me every word of him he told me over telephone while coming in on the car i said i will definitely mention this in the august audience so this is the situation that we are facing now the second part of the question is vijayalakshmi ji i request you to kindly give me patient hearing because you people our malaviya ji they took the initiative to invite me 
because most of you have visited Balaji Temple Chilkur. Now what is the specialty there? What is the alternative that you suggest? That is the question. You all got to know a journal called Walk, that is the voice of temples. It is fighting for all the temples in the entire universe, for all the temples. It fought for the temple located at Nepal. It fought the temple located in Burma. Not only the Hindu temples, even Buddhist temples, Jain temples, all that. Now, you know, pardon? Just one minute. One minute. I must. Uh, Swami Dayanandaji is going to be leaving. He has a flight to catch. I request that nobody gets up, please. Swamiji heard my speech, no? Prashne Pujya Swami Shri Virabhadra Shivacharya Ivarige Nama Indina Pilige and the Yuva Pilige Na Hege Nama Devasthana the Karakramagalali, Chetuatikalali, Avarna Avalamisko Bhudu Endu Indina Yuva Pilige Now Omame Norteve Sakash to Dura Dura Hoktare now Yavaga Yeshtu or Gehel Hodashto or Concha Dura Saritare, Yurna Hegena Unama Devasthana Matunama each at Twitter Kegala Liavana Avalamiskobo Hudu and one the Prashni Yvatu Yvakuru Atenta Buddhivantor Yvatina Yvakarige Purana da Kategalana Itihasa da Putagalana Hildre Nambike in the Nambuantor Alanta Hagagi Ivatina Namadharmika Kendragalagir Bodu Dharmika Achar Bicharagalagir Bodu 
ಅವರಿಗೆ ನೀವು ಮಾಡಬೇಕು ಅಂತಷ್ಟೇ ಹೇಳಬಾರ್ದು ಆ ಧಾರ್ಮಿಕ ಆಚರಣೆಗಳಿಗಿರುವಂಥ ಲಾಭ ಏನಿದೆ ಅದರ ಮಹತ್ವ ಏನಿದೆ ಅನ್ನೋದನ್ನು ನಮ್ಮ ಯುವಕರಿಗೆ ಏನಾದರೂ ತಿಳಿಸಿದರೆ ಮೊದಲನೇದಾಗಿ ಆಚರಿಸುವಂಥ ನಮ್ಮ ಯುವಕರು ನಮ್ಮ ಭಾರತೀಯ ಸಂಸ್ಕೃತಿಯ ಪ್ರತಿಯೊಂದು ಆಚಾರವು ಸಂಸ್ಕೃತಿಯು ಒಂದು ಆಧ್ಯಾತ್ಮಿಕ ತಳಹದಿ ಮೇಲೆ ನಿಂತುಕೊಂಡಿದೆ ಮತ್ತೊಂದು ವೈಜ್ಞಾನಿಕ ತಳಹದಿ ಮೇಲೆ ನಿಂತುಕೊಂಡಿದೆ ಆ ಎರಡೂ ವಿಚಾರಗಳನ್ನು ನಮ್ಮ ಇವತ್ತಿನ ಯುವ ಪೀಳಿಗೆಗೆ ನಾವೇನಾದರೂ ಕೊಟ್ಟಿದ್ದೇ ಆದರೆ ಖಂಡಿತವಾಗಿ ನಮ್ಮ ಧಾರ್ಮಿಕ ಕೇಂದ್ರಕ್ಕೂ ಸಹಿತ ಬರ್ತಾ ಇದ್ದಾರೆ ನಮ್ಮ ಧಾರ್ಮಿಕ ಆಚಾರ ವಿಚಾರ ಅಳವಡಿಸಿಕೊಳ್ಳಿಕ್ಕೆ ಸಾಧ್ಯವಾಗುತ್ತೆ ಇವತ್ತಿನ ನಮ್ಮ ಧಾರ್ಮಿಕ ಪೂಜ್ಯರಾಗಿರ್ಬೋದು ಅಥವಾ ಕೆಲವು ಆಚರಣೆಗಳನ್ನು ಮನೆಯಲ್ಲಿರ್ತಕ್ಕಂಥ ತಂದೆ ತಾಯಿಗಳಾಗಿರ್ಬೋದು ಬರೀ ಆಧ್ಯಾತ್ಮಿಕ ತಳಹದಿಯ ಮಾತ್ರವನ್ನು ಅದರ ವಿಚಾರವನ್ನು ಹೇಳ್ತಾ ಇದೆ ಬಿಟ್ಟರೆ ಅದರಿಂದ ಆಗುವಂಥ ಲಾಭ ಮತ್ತು ಅದರಿಂದ ಆಗುವಂಥ ಪರಿಣಾಮವನ್ನು ಹೇಳದೇ ಇದ್ದಕ್ಕಾಗಿ ನಮ್ಮ ಯುವಕರು ಅದನ್ನು ಅನುಸರಿಸ್ತಾ ಇಲ್ಲ ಇವತ್ತು ಈ ಒಂದು ಚಿಂತನೆ ಇಟ್ಟುಕೊಂಡು ಧಾರ್ಮಿಕ ಆಚಾರ ವಿಚಾರನ ಇವತ್ತು ಸಾಫ್ಟ್ವೇರ್ ಇಂಜಿನಿಯರ್ಸ್ಗಳಿಗೆ ಅವುಗಳನ್ನು ಸೂಕ್ಷ್ಮವಾಗಿ ಅದರ ಮೂಲ ತತ್ವವನ್ನು ಹಿಡಿದಾಗ ಎಷ್ಟರ ಮಟ್ಟಿಗೆ ಅಳವಡಿಸಿಕೊಂಡಿದ್ದಾರೆ ಅಂತ ಹೇಳಿದರೆ ಮೂರ್ನಾಲ್ಕು ದಿವಸ ಹಿಂದಂದರೆ ಹೋದ ಸೋಮವಾರ ಅಮೇರಿಕಾದಿಂದ ಒಬ್ಬ ಭಕ್ತರು ಬಂದು ಧಾರ್ಮಿಕ ಆಚಾರ ಚೆನ್ನ ಮಠದಲ್ಲಿ ಬಂದು ಇವತ್ತು ಅವನ್ನು ತಮ್ಮ ಮಕ್ಕಳಿಗೆ ಕಲಿಸೋದ್ರು ಅಷ್ಟೇ ಅಲ್ಲ ನಮ್ಮ ಧಾರ್ಮಿಕ ಸಂಸ್ಕಾರವನ್ನು ಕಲಿಸಿ ಲೋಕೇಶ್ ಎನ್ನುವ ಸಾಫ್ಟ್ವೇರ್ ಇಂಜಿನಿಯರು ತನ್ನ ಮಗನನ್ನು ತನ್ನ ಮಗಳನ್ನು ಜೆ ಎಸ್ ಎಸ್ ಶಾಲೆಯಲ್ಲಿ ಓದಲಿಕ್ಕೆ ಇಲ್ಲೇ ಬಿಟ್ಟು ಉದ್ಯೋಗೋಸ್ಕರವಾಗಿ ಇಬ್ಬರು ತಂದೆ ತಾಯಿಗಳು ಅಮೇರಿಕಕ್ಕೆ ಹೋದರು ಕಾರಣ ಅಲ್ಲಿ ಸಂಸ್ಕೃತಿ ನಮ್ಮ ಮಕ್ಕಳಿಗೆ ಬೇಡ ಅನ್ನುವಂಥದ್ದು ಏನಾದರೂ ನಮ್ಮ ಸಂಸ್ಕೃತಿಯ ಮೂಲ ತತ್ವಗಳನ್ನು ಆಚಾರಣೆಗಳ ಅವುಗಳನ್ನು ಮುಟ್ಟಿಸಿದ್ದೇ ಆದರೆ ನಮ್ಮ ಭಾರತೀಯ ಪ್ರತಿಯೊಬ್ಬ ಯುವಕರಲ್ಲಾಗಿರ್ಬೋದು ಪ್ರತಿಯೊಬ್ಬ ಭಕ್ತರಲ್ಲಾಗಿರ್ಬೋದು ರಕ್ತದ ಕಣಗಳಲ್ಲಿ ಭಾರತ ದೇಶದ ಸಂಸ್ಕೃತಿ ತುಂಬಿದೆ ಆದರೆ ಅದರ ಮೂಲ ತತ್ವದ ಆಚಾರ ಯೋಚನವನ್ನು ಅವರಿಗೆ ಅರಿವಾಗದ ಕಾರಣಕ್ಕಾಗಿ ಅದನ್ನು ಅಳವಡಿಸಿಕೊಳ್ತಾ ಇಲ್ಲ ಬಿಟ್ಟರೆ ಅವರಲ್ಲಿ ಮೊದಲಿರತಕ್ಕಂಥ ನಮ್ಮ ದೇವರ ಧರ್ಮದ ಆಚಾರ ಸಂಸ್ಕೃತಿ ಬಗ್ಗೆ ಇರುವಂಥ ಪ್ರಶ್ನೆಗಳಿಗೆ ಮೊದಲು ನಾವು ಉತ್ತರ ಕೊಡಬೇಕು ಪೂಜ್ಯರಾಗಿರ್ಬೋದು ಇವತ್ತು ಧಾರ್ಮಿಕ ಮುಖಂಡರಾಗಿರ್ಬೋದು ಇವತ್ತು ಎಲ್ಲ ವಿದ್ವಾಂಸರಾಗಿರ್ಬೋದು ಮೊದಲು ಅವರಿಗೆ ಪ್ರಶ್ನೆ ಕೊಡಲಿ ಕೇಳಲಿಕ್ಕೆ ಅವಕಾಶ ಕೊಡಬೇಕು ನಿಮಗೆ ಏನು ಡೌಟ್ಸ್ ಇದೆ ಕೇಳಿ ಮೊದಲು ಪುರಾಣ ಪ್ರವಚನಗಳ ನಂತರ ಮಾಡುವ ನಾವು ಮೊದಲು ನಿಮ್ಮ ಡೌಟ್ಸ್ ಕ್ಲಿಯರ್ ಮಾಡಿಕೊಂಡು ನೀವು ನಮ್ಮ ಹತ್ರ ಬನ್ನಿ ಅನ್ನುವಂಥದ್ದು ಕಡೆ ನಾವು ಹೇಳಿದಾಗ ಅಥವಾ ಅದನ್ನು ತಿಳಿಸಿದಾಗ ಅವರಿಗೆ ಅವಕಾಶ ಕೊಟ್ಟಾಗ ಖಂಡಿತವಾಗಿ ನಮ್ಮ ದೇಶದ ಸಂಸ್ಕೃತಿಯನ್ನು ಎತ್ತಿ ಈಗಾಗಲೇ ಸುಬ್ರಹ್ಮಣ್ಯ ಸ್ವಾಮಿ ಹೇಳಿದಾಗೆ ಮತ್ತೆ ಈ ಭಾರತ ದೇಶ ಇಡೀ ಜಗತ್ತಿಗೆ ಆಧ್ಯಾತ್ಮ ಗುರು ಆಗಲಿಕ್ಕೆ ಯಾವುದೇ ಸಂದೇಹ ಇಲ್ಲ ಅದು ಯುವಕರಿಗೆ ನಾವು ಕೊಡುವಂಥ ಕೆಲಸವನ್ನು ಮಾಡಬೇಕು ಅಂತ we are sorry i think shri mv saundarajan was asked the question as to what is the alternate to government control on temples he had not completed his answer over to him again to complete his answer we are sorry sir <laughs> because we have succeeded in showing the alternative arrangement alternative model it is not the alternative model it was there from the beginning from the beginning of this university is there only we have forgotten we have revived it now what we have done at chilkur there is no ticket system please every one of you who have visited you knows you are having you no know, a book with you called legislation for temple destruction all that uh, our representative from tamil nadu has spoken because the entire disease has come from tamil nadu only and you read that there is another book which i have given that is the book which was the memorandum presented to justice sri krishna committee he asked me a question in what way you are concerned about this particular matter it was about bifurcation 
I said, we are concerned, we are the most concerned people in the society. The people in the temples, they have to pray for the welfare of the people. They have to work for the welfare of the society. That is how we have been trained. First, you know, I was alerted sometime later on, he increased it and all that. Now, that will also speak to you. The third alternative thing which I am just you now telling Dr. Subramani Swami is, please take out P. Dr. C. P. Ramaswamy, your commission report. We are given the gist also in that. And please implement it. That was appointed by Jawaharlal Nehru. It was given when Jawaharlal Nehru was alive. And it was forgotten. Now, that is by the way. Now, coming to the straight question, what is that we have done? I have told you that there is no ticket system at all in our temple. There is no hunti at all in our temple. If you, may, if you maintain a hunti, the endowments department will come. The governmental interference will come. Therefore, no hundi, no dakshina system at all. There is a total non-commercialization concept which is being practiced. Now, the Chief Minister asked me, we have been given a special GO. The Chief Minister asked me a question. That special GO has exempted our temple. Now you are there, you are managing it. But what will happen to you what will happen to this temple after you? He asked me that question. I told him, this is how our temples have been managed. Only you people have interfered and you have destroyed the system. It is a secular country. Let us practice secularism completely. And why should you violate it only for Hindu temples? I asked you this question. Then the next question which he asked me was, what will we do? Suppose somebody wants to pay something. I said, let us open a, an account called a daily puja fund. And that daily puja fund, if anybody wants to give donation, if it is more than 100 rupees, we will not take. It will be credited online to the nationalized banks. We have opened it. You will see now in the, in the walk journal, in the cover page, that particular detail is there. You know how much money we have collected so far? We have not drawn even one rupee out of it. Even one rupee out of it, we have not drawn. What is the amount which you have collected so far, you know? 7.5 crores. There is no temple in the entire state of Andhra Pradesh. Entire state of Andhra Pradesh. All the temples are having overdraft only. But our temple is not having the overdraft. How you are maintaining it? Why are you bothered, I say? The God is there, he will maintain it. He is God. The devotees will maintain it. You hand over the temples to the devotees. So what will happen? Now, this is the thing which has been proved. All over the world, the devotees are there. And they are contributing. Today, we have become a powerful force in Andhra Pradesh. The government is shivering by seeing, you know, that journal walk. It is just shivering, that's all. What will happen? Yesterday, day for yesterday, the present endowments minister, he spoke to me over phone. I am going to America today evening. Now, this is my position. What can I do? All that, you know, he was telling. 
Now he will come back on 16th. But I don't go and beg them. I will not, in my room I will be sitting there. They themselves will come. Now the only sutram which I am preaching, Swamiji's are telling, the only principle is the pujaris should behave properly. They, why the Sabanayakar temple case, Subramani Swamiji, why he has won? Because they, the Dikshidars, they have conducted themselves like that. Therefore, therefore he was ob able to argue much better. The entire argument of Subramani Swamiji, my son was there in the Supreme Court and we got it completely and we have published it also in the Vogue Journal. One more point now which I am just telling you. Tirupati Devasthanam is not the personal property of the Andhra Pradesh government alone. <laughs> it, is, it is the property of all the people in the country. They have no, they have no right to, only they have got a right, that sort of a feeling is not going to be there. We are going to fight it out. We are going to fight it out. Please, Article 14 of the Constitution is there for all, there should be no discrimination. The ticket system which has been introduced in all the teams, that VIP treatment, no VIP treatment in our temple. No VIP treatment, even the, even the chief minister, if he has to come, he has to come only in the queue. That's all. Now that's why we have got a special place. My only appeal is, the alternative model is, you practice the Chilkur methodology. All the temples, you asked now a question just now. What will happen? Why the Swamiji is what? When, the, when will they assemble? When they will receive? All the Swamiji's will come. They will, they all, they have all support, they are all supporting me. They will appreciate. A day will come. Today I have told going to be a conflagration. There is going to be a revolution. The devotee, it is not the question of the Archakas versus the temples, all along. No, it is the devotees versus temples. You are going to see very soon what is going to happen. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, sir. The next question, of course, is to Sri Subramaniam Swami. There are actually three very interesting questions that I'm holding in my hand. Question number one, should temples be used to train people in self-defense and dharma to combat fundamentalism. <laughs> Temples uh, should have uh, uh, classes for uh, yoga, martial arts. Uh, I must tell you that karate, which is uh, people think has come from Japan, actually went from here through bodhidharma who took it to, uh, to China and in Shaolin he taught them what in Chinese is called Wushu, which then was taken to Japan and uh, the Wushu character for Chinese is pronounced as Karate and then it came back to us and we think it is Japanese. It is actually from uh, Malabar Hills, I mean from the Malabar part of Kerala and uh, therefore I think that uh, teaching uh, these martial arts more for women than men because today women need more protection than men. And uh, fundamentalism you don't worry, the Indian army can take care of it, you don't have to worry about that. <laughs> Thank you so much sir. The Supreme Court judgment on the Tamarinad Nataraj temple, is this applicable to all the states? Yes, 100%. Go back and see 
the takeover geo does it specify a time period if it does not finish on the spot it is Ill it is ultra virus the constitution and the judgment of the supreme court and you can get uh, asked for a quashing of that geo which uh, authorized the government to take over the administration and if it uh, uh, has been applied to denominational temples where there is a special reason why that temple was created like in the case of Pudu Dikshitas created Sabha temple then uh, that cannot be taken over by the government that also you can apply so I would say that you should uh, go to Google perhaps and say uh, Subramaniam Swami was the state of Tamil Nadu in the uh, Sabha Nayagar temple case you will get the judgment or you go to any lawyer and ask them to take it out from the Supreme Court cases digest which will give you the judgment please read it it can be applied to every part of India for every temple thank you sir huh? before this I is the law of the land yes before I ask you the third question there's another question that actually several people have asked this question to Sri Krishna Raj Varma so I have put together all these questions and the question is Kerala is known as God's own country for many reasons there are innumerable temples in Kerala what is the situation in Kerala especially with reference to the Aradmula temple now pranam to all uh, Guruji's elders my friends see Kerala <coughs> As the introductory speaker has told, it started with Monroe. In 1811, 348 major temples were taken in Cochin alone, with 1,128 minor temples. In 1903, 116 temples were taken over. In 1812, 25,000 acres, well, I'm sorry, 35,000 acres alone of Sri Patmanabha Swami temple was taken over. So lakhs and lakhs of acres of temple temples were taken over and as uh, Dr. Swami ri rightly knows in constitution it is provided for compensation of some 51 lakhs. For lakhs and lakhs of uh, properties taken over by the government. Now what is happening in Kerala? No, we had uh, as uh, uh, my earlier speaker has rightly put it, the Kerala government has appointed three commissions. One is uh, C, uh, headed by C.P. Ramaswamy Iyer. He was appointed in 1960, report was submitted in 1960. Then one by Kuti Krishna Menon, he also submitted his report in 1963. Then by Dr. C.P. C.R. Krishna Murthy in 1973. And uh, Mr. Baskaran Nair in 1979. Now the latest report says, it is proposing establishment of temple administrative committee in all temples. And the entire temples of Kerala will be divided into 59 mandals based on his uh, taluk wise. Then each representative will form uh, Tharma Sabha. Tharma Sabha. Then Tharma Sabha will elect three members of Tharma Samadhi. That, will, that committee is to rule. That is a rec recommendation of the latest committee. That is it, that has happened in 1976. And the control of the government is only pertaining to the auditing. And that has to be done by an officer appointed by the CAG. If there is any misappropriation, complaint of misappropriation or any mismanagement, the government can interfere for a particular period of time to cure that defect alone. So, in spite of this recommendation made by the committee as early as in 1973, the government of Kerala has refused to do anything in this matter. So, I request Dr. Swami to interfere in this matter effectively to use the to use Dr. Swami's influence of the central government to 
to pass a law under the concurrent list so that the entire administrative temple can be taken over in Kerala. Now what happens? Now what is happening in Kerala? In Shabrimala, crores and crores of rupees are collected by the government. Now, for, for, the, for traveling, for KSRTC, KSRTC is in normal, normal rate of KSRTC, if it is for 2 rupees for a kilometer, for traveling to Shabrimala at season, they will charge 25 rupees. As far as electricity is concerned, for every unit, if 2 rupees is the normal charge, for Shabrimala, they will take 25 rupees. So these sort of exploitations are being taken out. And that too in a country where the subsidy for Hajj is given from, you will be shocked to hear this, the subsidy for Hajj is being given from Consolidated Fund of India. When the constitution specifically prohibits any use of money from Consolidated Fund of India without the sanction of the constitution, it is being done by an executive order. So such a serious illegality is being practiced in this, in this, in this country and Hindus are being exploited. Now what has happened in Aramula, it is a 1500 year old temple, Parthasarathi temple. It is in the form of giving moksha. Bhagavan is in the form of giving moksha. This temple is surrounded by some hillocks, which is part of the culture of the temple and paddy field. And when this proposal of airport has come, the government has not even, government has taken 10% share in that company owned by uh, some KGS group, wherein Reliance has also got some stake. Vadra, Vadra, Vadra is actually Vadra, Vodra is <laughs> what we have learned what we have learned is it is not an airport project it is basically a pilgrim city project envisaged by uh, Reliance so Vodra has, Vodra has come in for facilitating this uh, uh, reclamation of the entire paddy land the agreement was with the Reliance to reclaim entire land and if if pilgrims, if it is, if the entire paddy field is reclaimed, almost 450 acres of paddy field is being reclaimed in the name of uh, some pilgrim city for the purpose of uh, setting up uh, five star hotels or something else, people will oppose. So airport was, was proposed. So that out of 10, at least four will say it's good. So the, the idea was to fill up the entire land and after filling up the entire land, the, the KGS group, which is front, front, front runner group of uh, Vadra, will withdraw and uh, the Reliance will come over and say, we will take over, we will we'll, uh, start up uh, this thing. So that, was the, that was the idea. So what happened? There was a proposal. If the, if the airport has to be set up in Aramula, the temple mass, the height of the temple mass has to be reduced all the hillocks will have to be uh, put down. These proposals really affecting the temple. Now, there are, there is hardly 100 meters, 100 meters of distance between the temple structure and the runway. It's a 1500 year old temple. There was absolutely no study concerning the impact of sound the impact of aircraft landing and taking over on the temple. There are almost 32 uh, pujas taking, taking place every day. So the, the molecular ordained system that is created by the chanting of mantras will be, breaken if, will be broken if this, uh, this aircraft is landed. All these issues will, has never taken into consideration and the Devasam board supposed to take care of these, in, in, uh, these uh, issues they have not I initiated any steps whatsoever to see that they interfere in this matter, raise their objection. Instead, they simply sat mute. Then a, a letter was uh, returned to the ombudsman. There was some ombudsman. And the there was some ombudsman has written a report to the division bench of the, uh, there was some bench of the high court. Now, high court has now taken the issue, now and spending consideration. And, uh, 
the entire Aramula temple will be in shambles if this airport comes. So this is a situation that is that is happening in India, where all the temples are being taken over. Not even a single temple is built. Lot of temples are taken over. Not even a single temple is built by the government. So I conclude by saying, requesting Dr. Swami, please, sir. Concurrent list. Use the power in concurrent list. Thank you so much. The next question is addressed to Sri Ramesh. The question is, why don't all temples unite and start a university about temple architecture and its ruins. It's addressed to you, sir. Temples are individual institutions. They can come together, but they cannot be united the way governments of various states are uniting now and using the consolidated fund. Every major temple can set up not just one university, multiple universities and multiple colleges. I'll just give you one example. Uh, in the presentation which we did, uh, area was shown of 305 grounds in an area called Boat Club Road. Against an income of 120 crores, of potential income of 120 crores per year, 36,000, that is 3,000 rupees a month is collected by the government. If the actual income comes, we can establish a university every year. So this is the state of affairs. Second, our primary concern of protecting our heritage sites should be in the form of conservation and preservation. A temple or a monument which is more than 100 years old can never be renovated. We should clearly understand the difference. It can be only very carefully conserved and preserved. For that, we need to have experts. And for that, experts, they have to be taught, they have to be created, they have to be educated. We definitely need an uh, institute or university uh, which will do this. Temples need not come together for that. All we need to do is get the temples out of government control, realize the real value of the potential income of the temple properties, then we can have not just this universities, we can have hospitals, we can have medical colleges, we can have engineering colleges, we can have schools, everything. We can have ultimate development. Thank you. Thank you so much. Before we finish, I have two last questions again to Sri Subramaniam Swami. Question one. I heard that many Vedic pundits are missing in the USA. There is no information about them anywhere on the net. What do you think the Indian government should do about this? Is NASA behind this kidnap? <laughs> so before you take that question, I'd like to announce that Justice Sri Rama Joyce will be leaving. Thank you so much, sir, for grazing the occasion and for being so supportive. Question to you, sir. Well, uh, I came across this problem when uh, the great uh, Shankaracharya of Shingeri uh, asked me to help in getting visas for some Shilpa Shastris uh, for the temple that is being built in uh, Pennsylvania uh, in the United States. And uh, the problem had arisen because the United States had declined the visas to these Shilpa Shastris. So I took it up with a high official in the U U.S. government. And he said the, the problem is that we, do, uh, in the, we did in the past allow many of these uh, religious workers, as they were called, under the visa category, and once they came here, they then disappeared and became software engineers in California. 
So I don't know whether these uh, Vedic uh, people, these Vedic Shastris are in that category, but it's impossible in the United States for uh, Vedic uh, people or anybody coming to the United States under a visa and then disappearing. Because after the 9-11 episode, the United States maintains a very, very thorough computer system uh, for keeping track of everybody who comes on non-immigrant visas in the United States. But since you have raised it, uh, I, will, uh, I will find out, but I, I have not yet come across this particular issue. Any more? Any more? Yes, yes, there is one question. We find that it is only the Hindu temples which are controlled by the government. What is the reason for this? Why are masjids and churches not under the government control? Is this a problem with the Hindus or is this a problem with the government? It is a problem with some kinds of Hindus in the government. <laughs> for whom, those Hindus for whom it is fashion to run down Hinduism and build a liberal image by uh, favoring the uh, minority communities. And uh, if you go home and watch today's 8 p.m., the big fight of NDTV, I have addressed this problem uh, in a debate that has taken place that this country today, whenever I speak in favor of some improvement of the Hindu community, they say it is communal and that I am trying to unite the Hindus. And uh, I feel that these secular Hindus have tried to unite the minorities. So it is all right to unite 20% of population, but it is wrong to unite 80% of the population. That's the message that has been going on since Jawaharlal Nehru. And Jawaharlal Nehru never listened to anybody else. Occasionally, he listened to Edwin A. Mountbatten. <laughs> and it is his, it is because of him that many of these attitudes have come. And now, for the first time, a party has come to power without the help of minority vote. And that is because out of the 80% Hindu vote, 30%, 31% voted for a particular party and we got absolute majority. And tomorrow 40% vote will get two-thirds majority. And if 45% uh, vote will get three-fourths majority. <laughs> and after that you don't have to worry about this problem anymore. Thank you so much, sir. I know I have another 50 slips like this, but we really don't have the time. I wish I could take all the questions. But we will be moving on to the next segment, which is almost the closing seg segment of today's uh, program. I request Sri Krishnabhat to say a few words. Venerable Swami seated in the dais, Dr. Subramaniam Swami, other speakers in the dais, respected brothers and sisters assembled in this auditorium. 
when we thought of uh, organizing this program, we were a bit apprehensive because nowadays we find that generally few people attend such public meetings. So many a time, even when we invite very prominent speakers, we find that the audience will be wanting in numbers. Therefore, when we booked this hall, my friends also were worried whether this hall would uh, be, we will be able to get so many people to see that this hall will be filled up. But it is our pleasant surprise and it is a very pleasant thing that the hall is overflowing and we had to make arrangement for people to sit outside and listen to the sp speeches of the uh, speakers who are here in this uh, meeting. Uh, the keen interest evinced by the people with regard to this meeting shows that they are uh, very much aware of the way in which the government has been all these years treating the Hindu society, the Hindu institutions, Hindu places of worship and the political uh, approach that the government is adopting. In our country we find that we have a government which calls itself secular. But a secular government by definition, it should mean that a government which uh, does not treat people on the basis of their religious denominations, religious faith, which keeps uh, aloof from the religious matters, it is an enigma for me that from the right beginning, the secular government has created a division in the country between majority and minority on the basis of religion. So, a section of the people, they are called majority because they belong to a particular religion. That is what the government believes. And the rest belong to a different religion and therefore they are minority. Once I remember a prominent political leader of our country, he said that in our political terminology it has been, it is being generally understood that if a person speaks in favor of Hindus, he is dubbed as communal. If he speaks in favor of uh, Muslims or minorities, he is called secular. So people who speak about Hindu society which just now Dr. Rafsami also said, which constitutes 80% of the population, it is dubbed as communal and the organizations also, they are dubbed as communal organizations. So, this kind of a political uh, policy has been adopted by the government, the foundations of which, the founding policies of which were laid down by as just now Dr. Swami said by Pandit Jawaharlal Nehru. The very concept of secularism that is propagated by our government, I feel it is a fraud on the people. Because a government which calls itself a secular has no business to divide the people on the basis of religion. It should treat all as equal. It is not doing so. There is one more thing. In the recent years, Dr. Subramanian Swami has taken many of these issues before the Supreme Court and su uh, several judgments have been delivered by the Supreme Court at least. Gradually, the things are being seen in the appropriate uh, light. Supreme Court has ruled in one of its judgments that 
the word hindu does not connote a religion hindu it refers to a way of life a culture a culture which is uh, which has developed in this country a certain values of life many a time i wonder how you can make a distinction between a cultural group and another a religious group and describe one as majority and another as minority if hindu does not mean a religion so it is not a religious group so it is a cultural entity then to call hindus as majority and muslims as minority or christians as minority it has no common basis at all but anyway in the name of secularism a great, great fraud has been played on the hindu society and great injustice uh, is uh, uh, being committed and uh, fortunately now the new government which has uh, come into power i think it puts an end to this uh, secular era and it will be able to look at things in the proper perspective and see that the majority of the people of this country and the cultural heritage of this country will be seen in the appropriate light and it will be given justice and uh, <coughs> we hope we are all hoping that under the new dispensation the hindu society will be able to get proper justice one thing we need to remember is that the temples in hindu society have got a very unique place they cannot be compared with uh, mosques or churches in those uh, religions churches or mosques may be the places of worship people following that religion they come into one particular place of worship they will all participate in common uh, prayer and they will give they get some religious sermons also but in the hindu society every hindu worships the deity in his home he has got a place of worship in his home and each individual worships god in his own way even within the family one may worship one god and another may worship another god it is not such a organized religion wherein there is one god and one uh, uh, book and one way of worship and all that it is a diffuse to disorganized religion यो यो याम याम तनुम भक्त श्रद्धया अर्चित इच्छति तस्य तस्या चलाम श्रद्धा तमेम विदधाम्यहम दट इज वाट भगवद गीता से श्री कृष्ण से भगवदगीता हुवर वॉन्ट्स टू वर्शिप गाड इन एनी फारम आई कन्फर्म हिस् फेथ एंड डिवोशन इन दट पर्टिक्युलर फारम सो इन दिस वे इट इज नॉट इन ऑर्गनइजड रिलीजन इट इज नॉट इन ऑर्गनइज ग्रुप हिंदू इज ए वे ऑफ लाइफ वैल्यूज ऑफ लाइफ एंड देर फोर टू consider the hindu places of, of worship as uh, religious centers and the government trying to control them that point was also brought to light and it was uh, pointed out by many speakers government does not want to control the places of worship of other religions and it wants to control only the places of worship of the hindus this happened because they thought that we can do anything with the hindu society hindu society will never react because yes i am aware of it hindu society will never react and this was going on till now times are changing now this cannot go on and uh, a new dispensation which has rises tries the hopes of the and aspirations of the people has uh, come in place and in the days to come we hope that the 
temples will be given their due place in our social and cultural life the government uh, should with its right hands it must be entrusted to the people to manage the temples the representatives of the people according to their own faiths according to their own uh, uh, systems of worship they will look after the affairs of the temple and this will be possible one more thing i need to point out here that we cannot even simply rest on the, our readers thinking that the new government has come and government do, will do everything modi will do everything now and we need not to bother that will not happen even if the new government has to do something we will have to shout we will have to cry and we will have to say that this needs to be done and i think the government will be responsive and it will listen to the voice of the people and the way in which the people have assembled together today in this meeting the response we have got it is really so encouraging and it will uh, i hope assume the form of a powerful mass movement and the hindu society will uh, definitely assert itself in the days to come to protect its so values its culture and its identity and i once again extend my very heartfelt thanks to one and all for uh, having attended this small meet meeting and made it a thunderous success thank you one and all namaskar please don't get up for the next few minutes kindly um this is my uh, duty to deliver this thing called the vote of thanks i believe that uh, since everybody is doing for hindu samaj and all of us are hindus i don't know whether i really have a right to thank anybody but maybe i can make mention that it's been wonderful that all the swamijis and everybody have come and so spontaneously accepted to come and uh, there have been several people who have come forward to help us with the uh, finances of the program but we need several 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 more and uh, so we have i mean i'm sorry i have to keep making this speech again and again that we need the support uh if anybody is interested seriously in uh, joining us in conducting more programs like this please email us i'll give you the email address you'll just have to remember it it's heritage h e r i t a g e dot yukti y u k t i at gmail dot com we are trying in our own little way we have a small organization called heritage in trying to bring temples to become centers of art and learning we normally do it between january and march if you want more information on that you can uh, write to us but uh, our point is that if hindus don't unite we are done for we cannot blame governments we cannot blame anybody else we have to unite so with this uh, uh, i really don't like making this vote of thanks addresses but we thank the college for being so nice to us and uh, being so cooperative in fact there was some small mix up and they said that we don't have a booking today and yesterday all of yesterday we had to spend here and they were very nice to accommodate us in fact they stopped the school program halfway and said uh, it's an important program you go ahead and carry on with your program and of course our institutions is always very very cooperative for any of these uh, programs i'm sure many of you come for swami parmatmanandas lectures here and uh, who else should i thank of course uh, all the youngsters who volunteer there have been several people we have to thank shankara tv for you know with very short notice they came and they said they'll cover it and uh, there have been several other small individuals who you know we just made a call and said please can you do this for us they have been standing all the way in third place to sit uh that is why we in fact we didn't want people to stand so we made arrangements outside but nobody wanted to sit outside because they wanted to see the proceedings here special thanks to them and uh we have namadeva we have managed to bring a few hindu organizations together here uh we have uh, of course hindu dharma acharya sabha then we have namadevasthana we have heritage then we have temple worshipers society of chennai jignasa c s s and many people who are not mentioned and uh, i think uh, i don't want to bore anybody anymore uh, namadevasthana was very particular i should say one sentence about them you want to repeat 
Namadevasthana is a group of people who are very committed to Hindu culture and Hindu dharma and they want to bring about this change that should happen in temples where they become centers of learning, education. And there's a group on Facebook that you can visit also for that. Uh, there's a Gudiya Samrama Facebook page, there's a Nama Devasthana Facebook page, there's Jignasa fa Facebook page, there's Heritage Facebook page, you can visit all of these. But please, please come in these numbers and please cooperate and uh, let us unite as Hindus. So we are going to end with Vande Mataram. I would like all of you to please stand, nobody move. Uh, our young lady Saumya, who we sort of uh, rough cuffed into starting uh, to sing, she is going to start it. After that, I'd like all of you to join. Bandi Mataram Bandi Mataram Bandi Mataram Bandi Mataram Sojala Sophala Malayaja Sheetala Shasya Shyamala Mataram Vande Mataram Shubhra Jyotsna Pulakita Yamini Sumit Dromadal Shobhini Suhasini Sumadhur Bhashini Sukhadam Varadam Mataram Vande Mataram Vande Mataram Vande Mataram With that we'll call and enter the program. Please be careful when you walk out. There's a donation box outside. Please contribute to it generously. Please do not mob the uh, dignitaries because they have to go out and we don't want a chaos here. Thank you.